coming up this week on the Markcast. Live here, well, kind of live, remotely live from beautiful, sunny San Diego. Tremendous show this week. Tremendous show. No, no weeks off here on the Markcast. Never forget, live here. You know, we're doing this uh, from California this week, remote, putting all of this together for you. All your CFL, USFL, and XFL content. The theme this week: XFL versus USFL. Can you handle the truth? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Really proud of the guest list I have for you guys this week, uh, featuring none other than Jonathan Heimbach, current XFL Arlington Renegades offensive line coach, formerly of the XFL 2020, formerly before that of the AAF. He played in the XFL 2001, has won Grey Cups in the CFL, and even coached last year in the Birmingham hub for the USFL with the Stallions. Jonathan Heimbach, players and coaches defecting to the XFL from the USFL. What does Coach Heimbach make of all of this? You will be fascinated to hear what he has to say, I promise you. But I think the thing that maybe has given the XFL a little bit more, I guess, of a leg up is that they kind of watch. They watch the USFL. They watch last season. We've seen how players have developed and we've had the opportunity to find some of the top players who maybe were in the USFL, they went to the NFL, and now they're ready to come back and play, and they're hungry to play, and they're gonna play earlier in the year. And then continuing our XFL 2023 training camp previews, we have Anthony Miller of XFL News Hub deep dive into the Renegades roster. We're talking the quarterback room, all the different running backs, Kenneth Farrow's return, Devion Smith, uh, the star-studded special teams that the XFL Renegades have put together. Lots of good things from Anthony. What I like about what they did with the backfield is have, you know, a multitude of good running backs because do I think Kenneth Farrell can carry the rock 20 to 30 times a game? No, not particularly, but having him and Davion Smith and Keith Ford all kind of contributing all at the same time, they each can do you know, eight to 12 carries a game and be able to kind of take the pressure off of them. You know, maybe once the season rolls on, he'll get, they can get more carries, but they're going to have a very balanced backfield with even an even amount of carries. And then if that wasn't enough, all of your CFL content this week, Mike Pinball Clements coming on the show, Ryan Dinwiddie, we have Craig Dickinson coming on, Jeremy O'Day coming on, Sean Burke and Bob Dice of the Ottawa Red Blacks, all of your CFL media day stuff, head coaches and GMs for three separate CFL teams. What would you know here coming up on the Markcast this week? Well, I can't think of a better way to start my morning here, bright and early. I don't even need coffee. We have Mike Pinball Clemens here. How are you doing, sir? Oh, better than I deserve. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for having me on. A lot of work going into the show this week. Like and subscribe. Thanks so much. Welcome to the Marcast Read here. Uh, you're not going to really recognize where we're at today. A beautiful, uh, sunny San Diego. If you're watching on the YouTube, we definitely recommend that this week. A really weird show. We had some pre recorded stuff from the CFL Media Day before. I talked with Coach Jonathan Heimbach before I left town last week. And then uh, Anthony Miller as well. You'll see just a cavalcade, lots of different backgrounds and things going on. Really appreciate you checking out the episode this week. Like and subscribe. Uh, I probably already spent about five minutes recording the intro for this show uh the promo that is you know talking through all the different guests we are going to have this week so i will keep this brief i'm going to try to get this edited so i can go outside and enjoy some of this uh sun uh as i record this i'm going to be hanging out with the professor andrew murray tonight that will be exciting hopefully we don't have too much fun and i am able to get up tomorrow morning Post this episode, coming to you a little early. I have to go finish uh, work here, coming down here for the week to uh, film some research crew, uh, research ships. Uh, very fascinating things over at the, the docks nearby here. So like I said at the top, you know, Jonathan Heimbach coming on. A really interesting way the conversation went, you know, talking about uh, you know, his time formerly in the USFL, now coming to the XFL. Curious, uh, I think you guys will be curious as well, the thoughts that, and, and things that Jonathan had to say about that, plus all the other work he's doing with the, you know, the offensive line group there, uh, getting them up to speed uh, in the XFL, you know, with the shortened training camp and all that. Lots of good things from Jonathan. 
Anthony Miller, long time waiting to try to get Anthony onto the show. Really appreciate that. I'm enjoying all these deep dives that we are doing. We had Matt Lyons on talking you know, the Sea Dragons last week, Sam Jess talking the Vegas Vipers. We've had Evan Wilsmore on talking about the Roughnecks before. And now I appreciate uh, Anthony as well doing a Renegades deep dive as we are in training camp. And then, like I said, all of the different CFL Media Day stuff, really appreciate everyone, Lucas, and everyone over at the CFL offices for helping to coordinate that. You have Pinball, Coach Dinwiddie with the Argos. We have Craig Dickinson and Jeremy O'Day with the Rough Riders. And then, obviously, Sean Burke and Bob Dice with the Red Blacks. Really appreciate that. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. Even if you're not the biggest CFL people, Pinball is a can't miss. Dinwiddie, you know, anytime you can get you know coach a GM for a, you know major you know professional sports teams, I uh, give it a listen. It's going to be a long episode this week, but I think you guys will appreciate that. Uh, before we go, uh, I did not have a chance to watch it last night when I talked with Anthony here, but uh, XFL just posted their QBX, the uh, Jordan Palmer kind of centric, talking about all the XFL quarterbacks. Uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous content. I just wanted to make sure that I said that publicly on the record already shared on Twitter. I thought this was great, but uh, really cool to get to see uh, Jordan. We finally get to see like, what were they doing on that couch in, in California that Jordan Palmer, you know, was showing them the TV and stuff. Really cool seeing all that behind the scenes footage. I like them also featuring the Russ, uh, Russ Brandon kind of prominently in that as kind of that Oliver Luck spokesperson for the XFL. But anyway, it's QBX. The XFL just posted it on their YouTube channel and shared it on Twitter. I don't know if we're going to get, uh, you know, QB uh, or, or uh, Q, QBWR. You know, we're going to get any uh, any of the other uh, position groups. You know, obviously they don't have anybody as, you know, as as prominent as Jordan Palmer there with the quarterback development in the XFL. But I thought that was really cool. I don't know if we're going to get part two or anything else with that. But you know, we we've been long promised this XFL behind the scenes content. Good to finally see some of that. And so I really enjoyed that getting good viewership. I looked on there a couple thousand views uh, so far for that. So if you haven't had a chance, make sure you go on the XFL YouTube, uh, check that out or on my Twitter. I posted it as well. I think that's going to be it. Like I said, it's going to be a long one trying to get all this out. Going to go catch up with the professor later. Uh, appreciate everything. Uh, Victor Quee's episode uh, interview is coming next week on the podcast. You will not want to miss that. Lots of good things with the, the president and CEO of the Edmonton Elks talking at the American TV deal and at the XFL, USFL, how that's affecting uh, everyone in the CFL as well. So, that will be good. Otherwise, the rest of the CFL stuff this week, Jonathan Heimbach and Anthony Miller, thank you guys so much again. Like and subscribe. Well, I'm excited today. We have Jonathan Heimbach here sitting at beautiful Chata Stadium. End of a day on Friday. Uh, well, this will air next week. I appreciate it. Uh, sir, how are you doing today? Reed, life is good. Um, the Renegades are undefeated. Uh, we've yet to have a real practice yet, so uh, hopefully things go well tomorrow. We can keep this rolling. Uh, well, this is good. I was looking at your impressive resume here, waiting. I always know that I have a good guest when I go online. A, you're already following me on Twitter, so that's good. We're already connected on that. But why your crazy resume here, and why you're such an important person to talk to? You know, part of XFL '01 as a as a player, I have coached all in the CFL. I just had Commissioner Ambrosi on the podcast today on the episode that aired. Uh, coached back in the AAF, coached in the XFL 2020, uh, was with Birmingham, and now has defected uh, to the XFL back <laughs> from the USFL. Uh, what thoughts just first off here, we're sitting uh, mid January XFL 2023. How is everything feeling for you? You know, it's really exciting. Uh, as you said, I've, I've had a lot of stops on the uh, alternative football world landscape here. Um, I think I'm one of two people that have been involved with, the XFL for the third time. I was actually a player in 2001. I won the, uh, um, the I was the center <laughs> on the million dollar game. And, and Tom Luganville was our quarterback's coach. And so he was a commentator with ESPN on uh, 2.0. I was coaching in Tampa with Mark Tresman. Um, and now here we go 3.0. So it's pretty cool to see where this has come from. Uh, 2001 as we were sitting in training camp in Las Vegas uh, with the he hate me and everything going on with the spectacle that that it was in 01. To see now, after being in the AAF, 
being in the USFL, being in 2.0, and uh, and now being in this uh, 3.0, it's just it, it's run the right way. Um, just with guys like Bob Stoops, um, Jonathan Hayes, our staff is basically a who's who um, with Tim Lewis, Jay Hayes, Bill Sheridan, uh, it, you know Scott Spurrier. Chuck Long. I mean, it is an incredible staff. And so every day as a coach, you just fired up how much football you're going to learn. And then you look at the caliber of players that are here in this league right now. It's pretty exciting to see. I I, I kind of pinch myself. It's kind of like an all-star group that defected from the USFL because they want to play a little bit early in the year. So it's pretty exciting right now. Yeah, it's a lot of we get it's heated right now. He did the spring football alternative landscape between that. We don't need to get too into that, but notable notable differences, like you said, feeling you know, you have all this you know, high powered, whatever executives involved, everybody else we were talking off camera before we started about some of your interactions today. But any notable differences going into this season compared to the USFL or 2020 XFL? Well, I think we've had a little bit more time. Um, I was actually hired two days. Uh, before the USFL draft, um, Skip Holt hired me two days before the draft. So I was kind of drinking from a fire hose as we were getting ready to find our players last time, uh, just the way that the calendar hit and had an incredible experience. I mean, I, I love Skip Holtz. Um, uh, you know, I, I was very grateful for the opportunity to coach in that league. Um, you know, uh, Daryl Johnston and I are, are close friends, Jim Pop, uh, who I won some Grey Cup championships in the CFL with, uh, just have great feelings for those individuals and what they're doing in the USFL and very appreciative of it. Uh, but I think the thing that maybe has given the XFL a little bit more, I guess, of a leg up is that they kind of watch, they watch the USFL, they watched last season. We've seen how players have developed and we've had the opportunity to find some of the top players who maybe were in the USFL. They went to the NFL and now they're ready to come back and play and they're hungry to play and they're going to play earlier in the year. And so, Reed, I think that's one of the things that guys have a little bit of appeal is we're the week after the Super Bowl. We're kicking this thing off February 18th as opposed to two months later. And as we were getting into the, the end of the USFL season, it got a little tougher. It's getting a little warmer down in Birmingham in May. Uh, guys are looking to play back in the NFL. And when you don't get those opportunities till maybe June, July, August, you're kind of losing that opportunity to play. So I think just the calendar and the amount of time that we have has really set up uh, really a, a better kickoff to the season as far as I'm concerned with my interaction with the league. It's interesting because we, you know, a lot of us casual fans, you know, not players, right? You, we sit online and uh, you have you have the pay scale, right? And like the USFL, who's paying more? And you have the timeline. And does the hub matter? Do people want to play? Do fans in the stands? Right? But you think the timeline itself is what kind of sets these two apart? I think that's one component. Um, I think playing in, in the markets is a big deal also. And I understand we're, we've got every team down here ready to kick off training camp here in the DFW area. So um, I think just having a, a hub for training camp and for training is a plus just financially for the league, and which is what we did in, uh, in the USFL last year just by having everybody play in Birmingham. But I think it's this is a little bit more fan-friendly with having eight teams going to travel to play in the home markets like we did in 2020. I mean, I can remember when I was in Tampa, our second game, or actually our first game, we played in New York. And then we turned around and then we went to Seattle. That was a little bit of a grind on us as a team. But we had to go silent count against Seattle because that place was rocking. I mean, it was a great environment, a great stadium. Um, Same thing we expect to see in San Antonio and St. Louis and those dome settings. I, I was able to coach in San Antonio with Mike Riley in the AAF. and. It was just an awesome environment. So I think those uh, stadiums have been well-planned, well-thought-out to, to have the games there. Uh, but I think the amount of time we have in training camp, I think we're going to have five weeks before we kick this thing off. 
that we're really going to know what we have and we'll be able to work through it as opposed to just a shortened training camp. And I want to say we're almost double the amount of players that we have in camp tomorrow on our first practice than what we did in the USFL when we started camp. I think I started with seven to eight offensive linemen, and now I have 14 here. So it's it, you're able to really give guys a legitimate competitive spot in a training camp as opposed to let's just get these guys to the first game. So uh, I think some of those lessons as these leagues have grown are, are going to put a, a much better product on the field. And, and I think everybody saw the product from the USFL. It was good football. And, and I think we hope to pick up the same. And I think two leagues are, are more opportunities for guys and more coaching opportunities, more executives, more, more ball is, is good for everybody. Uh, well, you speak of the Dragons Vipers game. I was there. We were there front row. Uh, I remember that was one of the lone Dragons wins we had back in 2020. But uh, it was that was good. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it was still Century Link at that point, but Lumen Field now, yeah, was rocking at that. We were yeah, front row, 50 yard line. How did you end up with, with Bob Stoops this time? Because obviously you were with Mark Trestman and, and Jamie Elizondo now, who is with uh, the Brahmas. How did, how did you end up with Coach Stoops? Well, I, I had met Coach Stoops years ago. Actually, my, my probably the biggest connection is our co-offensive coordinator, Chuck Long. And I was the offensive line coach for Chuck when he was a head coach at San Diego State. Uh, this was 2006, 7, and 8. We were down in San Diego together. Um, we spent some time with, with his previous staff when he was at Oklahoma, and that's where I met Coach Stoops the first time. But really, when when 2.0 was going on, I had built a relationship with, with Chuck, obviously, and then Jonathan Hayes, who's our other coordinator. And we've just stayed in touch. And when things started moving, there was an opportunity here. Uh, I think Chuck felt like he could go to bat for me. And, and uh, just being able to be around the type of coaches that we have, like I said, I dropped some of the names earlier. It, it's really a who's who. Uh, and, and every day it's, uh, we're learning more as, as coaches, as we're learning scheme, as we're getting to know each other, but to work with a guy like Bob, it's, uh, it's, I couldn't ask for more. And, uh, I had a great experience with Mark in, in Tampa. And, uh, I know that, uh, Jonathan Hayes did a great job in St. Louis. So it's kind of, uh, um, an education for me working with some of the best out there. Yeah, because uh, bringing in now kind of the best of St. Louis in with Coach Stoops here, uh, you, were you impressed with what they were able to do up at, with the Battle Hawks back in 2020? We were actually getting ready to play them. Uh, so when COVID hit, we were game planning, prepping at Tampa. Uh, we had just um, fin- we just lost a close one to L.A. And I think it was one of the games we were down to the end. We were going down to tie it. And I think that uh, Schwartzstein and, and Oliver Locke had figured we might be the first overtime game in the XFL. And unfortunately we, uh, we threw it to the wrong color Jersey and game over. So we came back and we were game plan and that was going to be a great matchup. I think we led the league in rushing down in Tampa. And I know they had the leading rusher with, uh, with the battle Hawks. So it was pretty cool. We were getting ready for that matchup, but obviously the world turned upside down. And uh, when the NBA shut down, we had a feeling that, hey, if the NBA stopped playing games, I have a feeling we might be done for a minute. And then here we are. Fast forward three years later. It's uh, it's great to be a part of this thing. How do you work with preparing the offensive line now with you know, far more limited time restraints? Obviously, like you said, you have longer than maybe you did with the USFL, you know, last season. But how, how what unique challenges does that have? Well, anytime you've got a new group. Uh, you have to to just build your rapport, build your trust factor with those guys. Um, one of the things that we had in 2.0, we actually were able to have uh, a mini camp, uh, which was nice to be able to get to know your guys, get a feel for them. They knew the scheme here. This is really the first time we've had a couple Zoom meetings here and there, but this is it's it's been a fast and furious pace this past week, um, and we were able to draft a number of ex USFL players that I had coached, uh, my, my first pick, our first pick in the, uh, in the offensive line draft was Cameron hunt, who was an all USFL player for us in Birmingham has a lot of versatility, plays guard, plays center, and, uh, was, uh, let go was released by, uh, the Sandy or LA chargers, excuse me. Um, and so when he was free of his contract, 
I was all over grabbing guys that knew what the spring leagues were all about. We ended up getting a guy, uh, Garrett McGinn, uh, Maya Tuahema, Teton Saltis, all guys that I felt were all caliber, uh, all USFL caliber players. And when you can pull those guys over to, uh, to this roster, you don't have to start from scratch. They kind of know what the schedule is. They know how to prepare and they're not just young rookies coming out of college. And we've got some young guys too, that, uh, um, I think are going to really add to the group. So excited that we've got some spring league experience, uh, but also the youth and, and it's neat to see all the guys that we would see walking around the hotels in Birmingham or games that you play against. And now you got guys like Kyle Sloter and Sal Canella and, and Davion Smith, guys like that, that are around the league that are resurfaced and, and all trying to put a great roster together. You guys also brought in some of the NFL Alumni Academy people. Uh, did you have you had any talking with them about how they're working with working with their offensive linemen so they're ready to go for you guys? Well, there was a connection. Steve Smith, who's the offense coordinator for the Generals in New Jersey, has worked with the academy for a number of years. And so when we had the opportunity to scout and search out some of those guys, gave Steve a call, recommended a lot of these guys who had been working and and uh, great to be able to add to our roster, like I said, to have more depth in this training camp than even what we had in 2020 and also with what we had last year in uh, in the USFL. So it's good to be able to have more roster spots, more availability. It keeps guys healthy, and uh, and they really get to show off not only what they can do for us, but to the other seven teams in the league. And y- you know that the NFL's keeping a close watch and they're going to watch scrimmages and they're going to watch these guys. And same with the USFL who we end up cutting, I'm sure will probably be uh, available to continue playing say in the USFL. Uh, In terms of the IFL agreement, do you think that having guys in the arena game, does that translate well? Is that going to be a good fit for you guys to bring in additional, you know, offensive linemen? I, I think the big thing, the more football, the better and the relationships that we have with those guys across different leagues, whether it be, you know, I coached eight years in the Canadian Football League, just building those relationships with indoor ball, with Canadian League, uh, with the USFL, the more football, the better. And uh, there's enough players out there. uh, They just need the opportunity to showcase their ability. Uh, Thoughts, I'll let you go here soon. Thoughts on the the hub setup and just how that works, being able to have kind of all the strength, conditioning, and everything there. You know, obviously you have Sean Hayes and Kerry Gordon working on things. Does that help kind of prepare everybody? Yeah, I would say it's it's great to have it under one um, one umbrella here in the Dallas Fort Worth area that um, our strength coaches are are sharing our individual strength coaches that are with us are actually training not only uh, the Renegades but also the Roughnecks because we share the facility here at Choctaw uh, during training camp. So um, they're able to keep a close watch. There's great communication between the staffs uh, from the top down. So I think it really helps just manage that and keep it all under one uh one area and then we'll be able to go scrimmage those guys we'll see each other in organized practices and i think the league's being really smart about getting things out getting things moving uh to to put a great product on the field this spring uh last question for me and i do want to ask you about five and one before we go uh five is one uh who you know you have a lot of familiar faces across all these different teams who are you looking forward most to facing uh you know across the field this season <laughs> well i mean it's there's probably somebody on every staff that I've coached with. Uh, I mean, between the San, uh, San Antonio team with Jamie Elizondo, I'm looking forward to matching up against him and, and, and their staff. I mean, so that's, that's always going to be fun to be able to see guys that you've, that you've won games with that, you know, you want them to have success except when you play them. So uh, that one will be fun. Um, you know, i got guys on Vegas, Bob Wiley, got a ton of respect for Bob and, and he and I have talked about ball a ton and, and, uh, it's just about giving these guys a great opportunity and, you know, trying to find the best offensive lineman out there and train them and get them ready to play. Cause it's, you got to use five as one, five guys have to be able to play together to get a scheme done and be able to function out there. And so we're excited about putting this thing together. Uh, yeah. Anything about your podcast, anything five as one before I let you go. Hey, get on there, guys. Uh, five is one.com. It's a, a, it's more than just a podcast. We've got apparel. Uh, we've got three states that we're currently training offensive linemen in. Uh, my home state of Colorado. We've got California, where I'm from, 
and then here in Texas. And then we've got some plans on the East Coast, really for middle school, high school, college pro guys, trying to do it all under one uh, under one umbrella to be able to build offensive line training. There's plenty of seven on seven trainers and strength trainers, but to get kids and, and, uh, offensive linemen technical training, I think is something that's missed and the, to develop the position is something that we've tried to do with five is one. So get on the website, get yourself some gear, uh, appreciate the shout out. And, uh, we're excited to see where this thing goes after the XFL season, continuing training guys and, and letting them chase their dreams. Well, I really appreciate it. Like I said, late on a Friday, I'm sure you want to get us started on the weekend. So it means a lot. Thank you very much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Jonathan Heimbach coming on the, the show. You got it, Reed. Good stuff. We'll see you guys February 18th. We'll be there February 18th. We got, yeah, all, all booked. Flights are going, so we're going to be there. Good deal. <laughs> Well, this is exciting. Uh, Mr. Elusive here. We all know of the Evan Willsmores of the world, the Professor Andrew Murray, Insider Mike Mitchell, uh, Anthony Miller here, also part of, don't forget Matt Lyon, don't forget Sam Just. I don't want to forget anybody now, but we have Anthony Miller, who has never come on the show, I don't think ever. I know, I think we did like a round table back in the day, but I don't think you've ever been on the Marcast. Welcome, Anthony. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, Reed. Appreciate it. I know we've tried like a couple of times, but every time I've, we've tried to do it, I've always been busy. So I'm glad I finally can get time to be on the show. So this looks way different for anyone watching me. <laughs> I am uh, on my, I am con continuity camped on my iPhone here, but I think it looks good. I think it sounds good. I brought, you know, I never know if, you know, world breaks or we have news to talk about, but Anthony and I have this scheduled. I'm down in San Diego for work. Hopefully the internet seems like it's okay here, Anthony, if I've been chatting, but we're going to talk uh, Renegades preview today. We've done our training camp. We had Pat come on, do the Battle Hawks preview. We had Matt Lyons do the Sea Dragons. We had uh, San Sam just come on and talk about the Vipers. Uh, Evan and I have kind of done the Roughnecks already. Uh, Evan was on our supplemental draft that we had as well. And then we will get Anthony today. First off the top, just this breaking news that came out today as we record this Wednesday. This episode will air Friday. Uh, they're going to have a media event next week, January 25th in... Orlando. It's going to have Danny Garcia, the mayor of Orlando, uh, Buddy Dyer, and then Trell Buckley there. Um, first thing that came to my mind was uh, this was either a playoff announcement, a championship game announcement, one of both. Uh, Anthony, what are your thoughts on what you think this media event is going to be? That is exactly what I thought, too. I think it's going to be playoffs and championship. I know the speculation has been it could be in Arlington since that's where, that's where the hub city is. It could be San Antonio. But now with this announcement that they're doing a press conference in Orlando, it just seems safe to assume that it could be playoffs and championship. I, I don't know what else it could be unless they're going to announce they're hosting like I don't know, weekly practices there or something like that for tryouts, but I know they're doing that in Arlington. So yeah, my assumption is it's probably going to be a championship game, which is a really interesting choice. I mean, that's a great stadium to play in. And I think Orlando as a city is a really good host city for playoffs and championships. So I don't think it's a, it's a bad option. I think it's a good medium between everyone that's in the South, everyone that's in the East and the North. So I'm assuming that's why they're picking Orlando because it'd be an easier travel arrangements for any fans that want to to come down for it. Well, I can tell you, this goes along with, um, you know, the XFL, USFL, spring football hates West Coasters. We do press conferences at 8 a.m. Uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Now, of course, this is the furthest distance I will have to travel to go from Seattle. So don't think that is not out of my mind. Uh, it is, to me, it's odd. It makes sense, right? We know it can't be at Chata Stadium, right? That's where the hub is. Uh, we mm -hmm. reported uh, you know, the Jackals, whatever, the rugby team there. They're playing the same day. And the timing yeah. would work out, but you know, God knows with the turf and everything. And what does that look like? Uh, obviously, we've heard the rumors of San Antonio. That makes sense. Somewhere in Texas, right? TDECU, you know, where it was going to be back mm -hmm. before. Orlando to to me makes sense because obviously we have Danny Garcia, you know, Danny, our guardians are kind of her team. I get that. But it does feel like when we, if you are, have purchased or are looking to buy tickets thus far for Camping World Stadium, they're only selling tickets on one side of the stadium, which to me says we're already cognizant of the amount of ticket sales we're going to have here. We want it to look good, pack everybody on the one side. Now we're going to have the championship here. Obviously you're going to get more people than a regular you know, week seven Orlando guardians game. But does that concern you that the hotness of the Orlando market? 
Um, well, I mean, think about it. that stadium is what 30, 40,000 capacity. And I mean, I don't know if Orlando is going to, because it sounds like the XFL's expectations is to try to get between maybe eight to 12,000 fans per game. So I, I don't, I, it sounds like the XFL is not really banking on the stadium being filled. I think for Orlando, the most they may do is maybe 20,000. Cause when the Apollos were there, I don't, they maybe hit 20,000, maybe one time. And that was maybe the home opener. And I don't know if they hit over 20,000 after that. So I'm sure the expectation is we're not going to be able to pack that stadium. So it makes sense to put people, put, to put all the fans on one side and make sure like when they're ABC and ESPN are doing their broadcast, they do it on the one side where the fans are and just focus on that. So it makes sense. I, I mean, I'd like the target of being eight to 12,000 for the XFL because they're kind of shooting low on it where the reality is there's going to be cities like Seattle, like St. Louis, San Antonio. They're definitely going to do more than 20,000, but cities like Orlando and Arlington probably shooting around 10 to 15,000 makes more sense. It's interesting just going back on that. Cause I obviously wasn't part of the XFL media back in 2020 and, you know, seeing some of the fan, you know, we got like 12,000 and, you know, for the wildcats or, Oh my God, like the sky is falling. And, and, and I know, I know the USFL is a different business model. God knows what we'll see here when we start up the Memphis hub here in April, but uh, you know, USFL would kill for 12,000 in a lot of these games. Uh, I'll be curious to see, yeah. you know, whether, what the Memphis turnout is there. Um, I just couldn't think of anything else it would be. I mean, I tweeted, it just screams chance. Championship. I, I is, like you yeah. said, you know, are we doing Canada? I just don't know what else you're going to have. You're going to have the mayor of the city there, Terrell Buckley. I, I know we would want, you know, maybe some of the other coaches, but Terrell's like the Florida, you know, he's the Orlando guy, like the Florida guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just kind of makes sense that way. But it is interesting. Um, certainly not opposed to it. Uh, you know, give someone a little, you know, beef outside of, you know, give someone a little nugget outside of Texas, right? Hey, let's toss, you know, Orlando bone. I don't know. Maybe, uh, anything else from that? I don't want to go too far on that but i do want to just mention that because that was kind of the breaking news today that seemed to kind of hit yeah i'm, I'm just interested to see what the announcer is going to be so i i hope it's championship and playoffs because i think that's maybe the last key thing we're missing before the season started is where the playoffs are going to be so that would be a good jump for the xfl to be like okay this is where it is and start selling tickets so i think they're hoping if they can sell they could start getting you know, selling the tickets as quickly as possible maybe they'll get more fans to go to it so I mean, it, it makes sense to get this announcement and get it over with before the season starts, even, you know, because the XFL has been kind of slow on announcements. So. Yeah. so, so yeah. So before we will, you know, we'll preview here, renegades, everything training, you know, we're, we're in the midst of training camp now, or, you know, I see like coach Beck is doing like his daily reports of everything. Mm -hmm. I like all this. I like seeing a little different variety from each of the social media people, you know, Haley and everybody was up here from the sea dragons, you know, they had Danucci Tosh and the fish and they were taking photos of this space. So, you know, I like yeah. where, you know, we get some of the posts that are like, okay, we have the new bucket hats available, but then a lot of it is different. You know, it feels like we have a little bit of personality how are you feeling because i have never you know obviously got your th thoughts on all this how, how are we feeling here mid-january a month out from kickoff i'm just glad we have everything set in stone in terms of like scheduling and stuff like that because that was a little nerve-wracking not knowing you know who's going to play where what the schedule is going to look like um social media I, I love what they're doing for social media but i feel like the xfl has got to step up their game because in 2020 that was kind of the xfl's forte was how you know their social media presence and all the work that they did for it so i, I love the presence they're doing that i love all the work they're doing with that they needed to step up and be on the same level as they were in 2020 overall i i mean i i think i'm more comfortable now that we have a schedule we're in training camp we get you know everything running because obviously i'm going to be very scared as the season goes on because we've been burned so many times by alternative football leagues that fail to get through one season. So I think for me, I'll probably be on pins and needles week after week. But once we get through the season, if we can get to the playoffs in a championship, then I think we'll be, I think everything will be just fine after that. Yeah, it, it feels to me like, you know, we're getting everyone up to speed right now, kind of at the same time as the players. Again, I, and I don't want to harp on this, you know, social's getting there, we're getting there, but like it, it does... It, it feels like like USFL season one was kind of a beta season. Let's kind of get through this and figure that. It more and more feels like that's kind of what the XFL wants to do. I don't know if that's what people expect and it's going to come out and it's going to be whatever. And I'm not saying that that is what I wanted or expected. That's not what I expected. Yeah. I, I expected, um, you know, I don't know if it was too much, whatever, but it does feel like 
not that we're going to like trudge through this. I mean, I think we're going to get through this. It's going to look good, but it, it does feel a little bit more like this is, you know, version 1.0 fan control football. If you followed any of that, like let's, let's get through a season. Let's see what people like. Uh, and then we'll go from there. But you know, it, it's, it's growing pains, but, but it feels, it feels real now that we're seeing, you know, people posting videos from training camp and people in practice jerseys and stuff. I mean, it feels really nice to see. Yeah. I, I feel I feel more confident this time around, I guess with the USFL, like I knew the presentation was, was not going to be so great with not having a lot of fans in the, in the, in the stadium. So that kind of was very off putting a little bit, even though I thought the play of the USFL was really good, but with the XFL being able to come to home crowds, I feel like the stadiums are going to be a lot nicer to see on television. I think it's going to be a better presentation. So I, I think overall, I feel a lot more comfortable with how the XFL is approaching it. I actually think the XFL is approaching it the best way possible where they're handling the financial side by doing a hub city in Arlington, but at the same time, making sure they're having that connection with their local fans and their local cities and being able to play games there and get players and coaches to interact with the local communities. So I think the XFL is kind of covering the best of both worlds. And, you know, that's why I feel a little more confident right now in what the XFL is doing with their business approach rather than the USFL's. Uh, you'll be interested here. Same episode. So we're doing the Arlington deep dive here. I, uh, Jonathan Heimbach, uh, Heimbach on. He's the offensive line uh, coach over there in the Renegades. I interviewed him last week here. It's going to be on this show, uh, you know, following kind of the first week of everyone getting in there. You know, Jonathan was involved in the USFL last year. He was with the Stallions and he was with the XFL back in 2020. He was with the AF. Uh, you'll be very curious. And, you know, that he lays out a lot of like, this is why you know, a lot of coaches jump ship or a lot of players and timelines and everything. Fascinating discussion with that. Still trying to figure out how I want to frame this as we talk here live. Uh, speaking yeah. of the, the Renegades roster here, and you know, I'm doing the deep dive kind of as everyone here looking through all this. Yeah, you know, we got Bob Stoops back. Uh, obviously, uh, you needed to have at least a couple of the guys from XFL 2020 back. Was he the right one? Renegades, what do we make of Bob Stoops making this return? I... I think Bob Seuss makes all the sense in the world. Um, I thought the the way he went about it the first time, the his approach to building the roster and having the talent that he had. I mean, I, I think it makes sense for him on a personal level. I'm, you know, I think he's got the itch to coach, but he doesn't want to have the college football head coach life and having to work all year and do recruiting and and trying to talk to parents and stuff like that. I know that's very tough on the the head coaches. So for Bob Seuss, this is kind of the best of both worlds where he can still coach, but but the reality is he doesn't have to, this is not a, a full year type of job. He only needs to work half a year and coaching it. So, and Bob Seuss is obviously a legendary coach. He's a natural champion, multiple time, you know, big 12 champion. He, he knows what it takes to be a winner. He knows how to develop players. So in that aspect, I think he is a great fit. And um, I was kind of surprised that he decided to come back, but at the same time, like it makes all the sense in the world for him to come back. He did a great job the first time. I'm sure he'll do a great job this time around. I mean, the roster already looks uh, pretty good from what he's done. Yeah, so we do some from a staffing level here, right? Obviously, you know we have you know, uh, Rick Mueller there, you know DPP, you know the, the, the strange choice here where we have co-defensive, you know offensive and uh, you know offensive and defensive coordinators here with you know John Hayes here, uh, Chuck Long, and then uh, Jay Hayes on defense along with Tim Lewis. Uh, why why do you feel like Bob Stoops kind of got carte blanche, carte blanche there to be able to say like I'm bringing him four of these like legendary guys to help kind of work there? Like how did we finagle all that? Well, I, I guess you got to think about the first time back in 2020, he had Hell Mummy as the offensive coordinator. And actually just before COVID happened, literally that week that the season the season was suspended, Hell Mummy had just left the team. So he was about to have a new offensive coordinator running the whole the whole offense there. So I'm sure he wanted a little more stability and be and this feels like it's a little more of an insurance, just in case maybe John Hayes or Chuck Long or Jay Hayes and Tim Lewis find another job somewhere else. He he has someone to back up and be like, okay, we have a coordinator that can run it. So it kind of feels like after what he experienced the first time, he's trying to cover himself just in case anyone leaves that staff. Uh, you know, it's kind of really taking the best of the battle Hawks here and molding it with, uh, you know, Bob Stoops. Uh, I, you know, don't, <laughs> I, I, I'm still not an Nexus and those guy certainly wasn't back when we saw Bob Stoops coach back in 2020. What are you expecting to see mixing you with Bob Stoops, you know, kind of his vision for football, you know, bringing in the battle Hawks, like I said, with the Hayes brothers and everything. What, what are you looking to see there? 
So I think the defense will be very similar to what they ran in 2020. It's going to be a, a three, four defense. That's going to rely on versatile linebackers on the outside. That was something that uh, former defensive coordinator, Chris Woods ran back in 2020 with the renegades. So um, that's the type of style that Tim Lewis ran when he was with the gamblers last year in the USFL. So I expect similar uh, defensive style there offensively. It's going to be a very different look from 2020, uh, 2020, how Mummy ran the air raid offense was all about passing the football, all about having versatile, Personal running backs, you know, being able to be to make an impact in the passing game. I think this time around, you know, Jonathan Hayes and Chuck Long, when they were with the Battle Hawks in 2020, that was the very run heavy team. They relied on Jordan Tiago. They relied on Matt Jones and Keith Ford and those guys who run the football. And you can tell by the way they drafted. I mean, they have Kenneth Farrell, they have uh, Devion Smith. I mean, that's a strong running game with a strong offensive line that's been built there. So to me, it feels like the Renegades focus more at the running back positions and the off its line to make sure that that's built right because the receiving core has a little bit of questions on this renegades offense but that that backfield is one of the best in the league and so to me it gives me confidence that i think the renegades will be a very run heavy offense and they should be one of the best to do it it's interesting that well obviously we'll talk about the quarterback share and you know the Kyle Slaughters of the world, but interesting, you know, you have all of these temple players from the USFL here. You know, Kyle Slaughter, we have Devian Smith, you know, famously with Pizzagate and all of that. We have uh, Kenneth Farrow, who did not play in the USFL, but obviously is with US uh, United Football Players Association, helped negotiate the USFL Z B A. Um Really interesting, you know, to have Kenneth be so involved in that and, and choose to play in the XFL. I, I you know, I Take that for what you will. Uh, what do you make of, you know, Kenneth Farrow's had a long off time here. I mean, I talked with him when he was on the show with the CBA and he said, you know, I've had three years off or whatever. Like I've never been more rested, but what do you, I mean, do, do we expect him to have that big of an impact coming back, back after such an off season? Well, that's a big question I have with a lot of the roster. I mean, think about it. Kenneth Farrell hasn't played since 2020. Devion Smith, I know he was with the Pittsburgh Mowers, but he hasn't really played any games since 2020. You look at their defense, too. Like, I don't think Nick Temple, uh, you look at like Nick Temple, Will Hill, Raheem Moore. These guys haven't played since 2020 either. So I have a little bit of concern when it comes down to that three year gap from the last time they stepped on the field and played. But, it, you know, the XFL. You know, there's a lot of guys that come into these alternative football leagues, maybe spend a little time off the, you know, off the field and having to get back into the flow of it. So the first couple of weeks of the regular season are always a little bit rougher, which I mean, kind of sucks for these alternative football leagues is you really get one shot at making a good impression. And there's an unrealistic expectation that the teams are going to be perfect in what they do. And that's just not the reality. The first two, three weeks are usually pretty rough for every alternative football league. So you got to give them a chance to get their footing in. So I mean, my expectation is it may take a little bit for them to get their, you know, their feet wet with the league. But uh, most of the time, once they're, you know, midseason, then they're usually back to to form. So it may take a little bit, but the, the Renegades have so much talent and so much veteran presence. They know what it takes to be ready for a professional football game. So I have confidence that they'll, they'll, they'll get it together once they're in the flow of it. Because that's, the, I mean, I guess that's the, that's the thing, like, you know, is Kenneth and Debbie, like, are they just that head and shoulders better than that the, it doesn't even matter they can have a couple years off i mean here we have you know i just i just watched tom brady at the age of 87 here play football on monday night but yeah. you know like you just i don't know i mean it, do you feel like kenneth is that special of a talent that, that you would rank him that high i mean i know we had some of the guys that go back you know back to the usfl here some of the drafted players you know on the running back position like is kenneth is that big of a talent do you think that big of a skill I mean, every time Kenneth Farrell and uh, Devion Smith have been on the field for whether it's the Alliance of American Football or whether it's the XFL, they've always been the top running backs in the league. So I, I have confidence that they can step in and you know do a great job. I think Keith Ford will be another good complimentary running back in that backfield. Um, I think Demontre Tuggle is going to be kind of a sleeper pick at that running back position. He's a guy that's actually been playing the last couple of years in college so at Ohio. So I feel like he can kind of step in there, be that versatile back that they need. But Kenneth, I think Kenneth Farrell and Devion Smith are going to be just fine. They'll be able to step on the field and they'll be able to make an immediate impact. Uh, what I like about what they did with the backfield is have, you know, a multitude of good running backs because do I think Kenneth Farrell can carry the rock 20 to 30 times a game? No, not particularly, but having him and Devion Smith and Keith Ford all kind of contributing all at the same time, they each can do 
you know, eight to 12 carries a game and be able to kind of take the pressure off of them. You know, maybe once the season rolls on, he'll get, they'll can get more carries, but they're going to have a very balanced backfield with even an even amount of carries. It's interesting. Though, and now we're, you know, we're midst of training camp and everything. And I, I know this is like the renegade steep time, but back to uh, coach back to the interesting video. Cause I do think the ballot Hawks, I, I think are, as far as I can tell, leading the charge right now, just in terms of like, let's get some little daily updates of what's happening, what's going on. Why is and like my wife is trying to call me? What is happening? <laughs> I'm like, uh, but I, I'm like, I, this is like weird, like uh, gl- literally like uh, duct taped, like in here, like nothing can move. I got Dorothy trying to call me on the phone. Um, you know, I, I, I think the Battle Hawks are doing the best job right now. Like, hey, Beck just kind of talking to us every day. Like, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. But um, he, you know, he was saying how, okay, we're finally getting into pads. We've really been spending the first week. Like, we're breaking bad habits. We're figuring out where people are at. Like, you know, it's interesting because it, it's such a short training camp. But then, you know, you're bringing in all these guys from scratch. It'd be hard enough if you had continuity from last year. But half these guys, you know, or you're coming in, you've been three years off. Like, you know, how do you balance that of like, okay, we got to get these guys ready to play mentally, but also like we got to make sure these guys can physically like go here. Uh, Fascinating. I don't, you know, I don't envy any of these coaches. And I don't think spring football is for every single coach that wants to do it just because of the, just the, it's such a rush job. I think Stoops obviously having been through it back in 2020 helps with that, right? We saw like Mike Riley and people. In mm-hmm. the USFL, but it's 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 such a challenge. I can't imagine trying to get up and get like a, an entire football team established here in like thirty days. No, and and that's why like there's realist there's unrealistic expectations when it comes down to the first couple of weeks. Because think about it, these guys only have a month of practice before they actually step on the field for the first game of the year. They maybe have like maybe one preseason game before they actually go into it. But a lot of times it, it doesn't look smooth week one, and everyone likes to crap on these leagues like, oh, the quarterback play is so bad and that, you know, the defenses are so good, but the offenses are terrible. Like, no, it, it takes time to, you know, get your footing in. I mean, in the NFL, they have two months of training camp before the regular season starts. And that's realistically how long it takes. And that's kind of the same thing with these leagues. It takes at least two months for them to get used to, you know, how, what systems are running in, you know, getting into a hundred percent football shape. It takes time. So realistically, these teams probably won't be at full strength till, maybe early mid March. And then that's when you're going to start seeing the good play from the teams. Uh, looking here, the quarterbacks, um, obviously you're bringing in uh, Kevin Anderson here with the supplemental draft. I'm reading uh, Drew Plitt. He was on our show. First quarterback off the board here with Bob Stoops back during the quarterback selection show. Drew Plitt uh, called in and then Klaus Slater, obviously with the USFL. Uh, you know, I hear about Orlando being one of the worst quarterback rooms in the league. Is this, to me, this feels really competitive. I don't know if this is the best quarterback room, but it feels maybe, am I reading that wrong? How are you reading these three guys? I mean, they're not the Vegas Vipers quarterback room. That quarterback room is absolutely insane with Brian Scott and Luis Perez. But I do think it's a decent quarterback room and it is super competitive because, I mean, no offense to Kevin Anderson, but I feel like it's a two two quarterback battle. I think it's between Kyle Slaughter and Jude Plitt. The question comes, you know, what is Bob's is Bob Stoops going to go with the more veteran quarterback in Kyle Slaughter, who's been in the NFL for a long time. He's played in the USFL. He's got more experience on the professional level or go with someone like Jude Plitt, who has really high potential and played incredibly well for the Bengals in preseason. It, they're they're both similar in terms of being bowl, but Kyle Slaughter is a little bit you know, taller than Drew Plitt is, but I think Drew Plitt's a little more athletic than Kyle Slaughter is. So really it's just a question of which type of quarterback you would want. My gut instinct tells me that Kyle Slaughter probably is the favorite to win that job, but it actually wouldn't surprise me if Drew Plitt wins it just because of his athleticism. So I, I think that that combination between Slaughter and Plitt, it's going to be really interesting. My gut tells me Slaughter, but I mean, I, that's going to be a really interesting battle in training camp. I just wonder if is, is Kevin Anderson, like, is he just brought in to be the elder statesman? Like you said, kind of, you know, I know he does his, you know, consulting, uh, you know, training kind of stuff. Like, is he brought in just as like, Hey, we need kind of a steady forester to help work with these guys. I just, you know, I always curious, like guys, mentalities going into this, like, you know, what, what am I reasonably expecting out of this? And then, yeah. like you said, obviously with, um, you know, veteran presence. I mean, we saw Landry Jones back in 2020. I mean, Bob Stoops can do a little bit with a little bit. I mean, I don't think Landry had much more in the, I think Kyle Slaughter certainly has a lot more in the tank. 
That's that's the concern with me too. Is that with with Landry Jones back in 2020? Yes, he was obviously going to be the starting quarterback just because he was the first player signed by the XFL. But really, Landry Jones was average at best. I mean, he threw a lot of touchdowns, he threw a lot of yards, but he also threw a lot of interceptions. And I feel like Kyle Sloter is pretty similar in that aspect to what he did to the USFL. Yes, he led the the league. You know, he was the first team all USFO quarterback, but the reality is he threw just as many interceptions as touchdowns. So I almost feel like the concern with Kyle Soder is, are we about to have a Landry Jones 2.0 coming into the running gates? So that's, that would be my biggest concern is that Soder is a good quarterback and he's usually pretty accurate and protects the football well until he went to the USFL. And then he had a lot of turnovers. So I'm really interested to see if he can cut down on the turnovers, be smarter with the football, maybe use his legs a little more to um, gain positive yards offensively. Uh, obviously, Sal Canella here. Is that another one of the the more marquee names you think of when you're thinking about the Renegades roster so far? He will probably be the leading receiver on that team. I mean, you look at the receiving core. It, it's not a bad receiving core, but there's there, there's fairly unknowns with it. I mean, Jordan Smallwood played with the Wildcats in 2020, did pretty well with them. Flynn Nagel, I was a, a you know Bob Stoops loved him back in 2020 as his slot receiver with the Renegades. So I think. But Flynn Nagel, also another guy who hasn't played since 2020, so I'd be interested to see how he steps in. Um, but overall, there's a lot of kind of uncertainty with the receivers. So Sal Canella just have already having that connection with Kyle Soder from their time with the Breakers last season with the USFL. That gives me good reason to think that like Sal Canella is going to be his security blanket and has a very good chance of being the next uh, Donald Parham. I just I never get why Sal didn't didn't latch on him. I know he spent right. He was on the the Packers practice squad right before the season. I just mm-hmm. you know I've watched him back through Spring League before. It just it's so weird to me some of these guys and I you know it's these little intangibles and people are looking for. I just some of these guys on here. You just I mean I think Sal Canelo is a, just a total rock star. It's just weird to me to see him. I mean. Obviously happy to see him in here, and like you said, him with Slaughter, and I think that that's great. And I know you know USFL people now might be, oh, I don't care about Kyle Slaughter, but I guarantee if Slaughter and Sal Canelo were back mm-hmm. in, in the USFL, you would care very much about that. But I think that's a good combination. You think of the the rest of the receivers here are up to par for what you think that Stoops wants to do? I think I, I think they are. Um, it's it's not the strongest position right now on the Renegades, but I mean, you look at veterans like Jordan Smallwood, Flynn Nagel, and even Chad Williams, who was assigned to them, but he's a guy that was drafted by the Cardinals in the NFL. So he's got some playing experience. So they do have some veteran presence while having some um, younger receivers on that team, like uh, Lawan Willingham, I think could be one that could really step up and be a, uh, a good receiver on that um, you know, in that course. But again, that's a position where I think there's probably more question marks at the receiver position than any other position within the running gauge right now. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what they do with that rotation and training camp and who they end up starting. Uh, in terms of the other side of the ball here, and obviously the you know the co defensive coordinators, I, I can't even hardly say that sometimes. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what do you make of this and the roster and what we've seen thus far, and especially with the supplemental draft adding in a bunch of the other guys? Uh, it is a very very heavy veteran presence on that defense. Um, I mean, honestly, the best pick they had was in the supplemental draft with Donald Payne. I mean, that was a massive pickup for the Renegades, and it's interesting because on the XFL website, it says he's going to play defensive line, but as we know, the website hasn't been 100% accurate on things, so I don't really know what's going to happen there with Donald Payne, Like he, but talk about a guy, he was a first-team all-USFL player. He led the league in, in tackles for the Gamblers. I mean, he was a fantastic player. I mean, outside of maybe Chris Odom, he was the best defensive player in that league. So I think having him on the roster, I think is massive, whether he ends up playing defensive end or, you know, plays that hybrid linebacker position, he's going to be huge. Nick Temple, every time he's played in an alternative football league, he's been phenomenal. He was great in the AAF. He was great in the XFL. So I think Nick Temple can make a big difference. Um, Edmund Robinson was good for the Roughnecks back in 2020. So I think he can make an impact at the linebacker position. Secondary is deep. I mean, Raheem Moore, Will Hill, Devontae Bigsby, 
Josh Hawkins, Robert Nelson, all these guys used to play in the NFL. They they all have experience playing in the in the XFL as well. I think though that that combination, the secondary, I think the the Renegades honestly probably have the best secondary in the XFL. And that defense is going to be really scary. If there's a strength to this Renegades team, it's definitely that defense, and in particular that that's secondary. But the linebacker position is also very good for them. Yeah, in terms of the XFL website, you know, I got on that this weekend. I was sitting, I was sitting watching this <laughs> Sunday, you know, Sunday wildcard games. Got a little, you know, I I get a couple of bullets <laughs> in. I get a little fiery on that on social media, but like, I I know we were talking today in the group chat along with the Danny Garcia press conference. Like, the XFL d- does need to send out press releases or update things right now when tra- tra- uh, roster transactions are going on. USFL isn't the best. The timing isn't always the best. Sometimes it's two in the morning, but y- y- it's reliable. It's on Twitter. Mm-hmm. We can follow what's going on. The CFL is a godsend with that. Uh, XFL yeah. needs to do that. But yeah, right now, if you're one of these people, if we're refreshing the XFL website, you know, 50 times a day, like, just don't take it for gospel right now. Obviously, they're doing their best. They need to work on it. This is something that I think they just, you know, they need to know. And the USFL needed to know. And just because we tell people things that they need to know it doesn't mean that we hate or they're doing a bad job. But, like, if you want people to take your league seriously, you need to do that. But, yeah, as for that, uh, in terms of special teams here, right, obviously, you know, Taylor Russelino coming back. And then I still just picture Marquette. I can't even get Marquette King as a renegade. I still view him as a battle hawk. Uh, strongest special teams grouping here that we have in the, in the XFL. I think so. I mean, I, I love all those former battle hawks that are coming on this scene because literally the whole special teams is pretty much all battle hawks. Bruce and Lino was the kicker for it. Marquette King was the punter for them. And even they got Joe Powell in the supplemental draft. And he was the one that returned the first kickoff for a touchdown in XFL history. So he's probably going to be a favorite to, you know, be a kickoff returner for the team as well. So, I mean, Bruce and Lino, just because of what he did in the XFL, that got him his shot in the NFL to play with the Broncos during the COVID season. Marquette King, I, I don't understand how he didn't get another opportunity to play in the NFL. I mean, that dude was a stud in the XFL by far, probably the best punter in that, in the XFL in 2020. So that unit in general, even Antonio Ortiz, I know a lot of people don't, don't know about him as a long snapper. He's really solid too. I mean, that that group for the special teams, really, really good. Probably the strongest in the XFL as well. Uh, so to round out our conversation here, I appreciate you hopping on here late here, you know, you're hours ahead and coordinating all this. I really appreciate it. Like, um, you know, we go through all these. I always think it's the strongest. Okay. This is, you know, the Vibers look good. The Dragons look good. Uh, how do you, you know, objectively view the, the Renegades here? Heady, you know, obviously we got to see final cutdowns and everything, but you know, heading into the season, as far as we know right now with the limited roster, tra- roster transactions we have, how do you view the Renegades as they shape out with the other seven teams? I will say defensively, I think they look really good. I think they're going to be very strong defensively. That was a strength for them back in 2020. I think it's going to be the same this time around, too. I think that's a really strong defensive unit. Special teams is obviously great. Offensively, they're going to be, to me, the roster looks like a very run-heavy offense. So I'll be interested to see how they make that transition from being a very pass-heavy team in 2020 to now being focused on the run, which – you know, we, we will see how that works out. I, I think at the end of the day, I mean, the Renegades are probably one of the favorites to go into the playoffs and win the XFL title. Do I think they're going to win the XFL title? Honestly, no, but they will, they're, they're, I think they're on the cuffs of it. And I think the difference is I, I don't know how strong that passing game is going to be for the Renegades just yet. And that just maybe me, maybe me just need to see the receiving core and how they do. And, you know, how much confidence do I have in Kyle Sloter or Drew Plitt, whoever the starting quarterback is. But, I mean, the offensive line is solid. They're going to be a good unit. Defense is really good. They will be competitive in every game. I can see them finishing 6-4, and 7-3, and three, get into the playoffs. And I, I don't know if they're an, a championship team yet, but they have the, the building blocks to be a really good football team. Uh, I will tell you right now, this isn't just for my Seattle Sea, you know, Seattle Sea Dragons loyalty, but uh, the team I want to most see win the championship is the Seattle Sea Dragons because Haley, their social media person, put out that she will be getting the next NFL tattoo if the Sea Dragons win the championship. So, okay, I, think I need to see that. Yep. I, think, I think ultimately that is the one that we need, but no, I, I think the running aids look good. I'm excited for this. Anthony, you were a stellar today. I appreciate you working, uh, you know, like I said, taking the time to come on. We'll get you on again here now. I like having these, you know, uh, like our team specific kind of reporters and then obviously talk XFL stuff as well. Anything else before I let you go? I really appreciate your time tonight. 
No, I just appreciate the the time to be on the show. I, I'm glad we finally got the time to to be on it. And I really appreciate the insights. So thanks for having me. Yeah, follow Anthony and all the guys you know over at News Hub. Anthony is doing the Renegades, and I, I just it's it makes the league feel real when we have you know all of you guys in in. You're tracking this all the time. It's more work than any single person could ever do, right? And so I think it's it's really important. And I just I hope the league appreciates that because uh, the USFL struggled with that in, in terms of engaging, you know, enough people to cover kind of the minutia of the week to week and training camp and all this stuff. And I think, you know, so far so good. I think we need to get more stuff out here. Like we said, roster transactions, but all of this stuff help makes a all of this stuff helps make the league feel bigger, you know, than it is. And so I think it's really important. I really appreciate all your guys' work. Yeah. Thanks, Reed. Appreciate your, your, you do great work too. So I know you do, you do great stuff for the CFO and for all the alternative football leagues. So you do a great job too. So I'm sure the league is appreciative of you. Yeah. No weeks off here. Since <laughs> beach side, beach side yep. in San Diego. I, just, I mean, this setup almost looks better than the one I have at home. I might just have to come down here more often and do everything. Uh, anyway, Anthony, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I well, I can't think of a better way to start my morning here, bright and early. I don't even need coffee. We have Mike Bimbo Clemens here. How are you doing, sir? Oh, better than I deserve. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for having me on. This is good. I told Lucas, I said, you know, we had you on. Last time we spoke, it was at a Casino Regina there before Grey Cup. I don't know if you yes. remember that. You had a busy weekend. I was listening back to our interview. You said we, you would need a miracle to beat uh, Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Yes, and and the other part of that was I believe in miracles, though. <laughs> so, so and and as you see, uh, that the game was just that. I mean, it you know you, when you have the two block uh, kicks in it, two block kicks in the last five minutes, two block kicks in a game is crazy, right? But they have two in the last five minutes of the game. I think he was in the last three minutes. Uh, just just crazy, uh, you know. And and you know, I can I can say as we as we get to this po- point of preparation, right? That the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are still a better football team than the Toronto Argonauts, right? We, we were the better team that day. And so part of what we're working to is to actually become, hopefully one day, uh, being able to say that, yes, we are the best team in the league. And uh, But uh, we, the, the opponent we play uh, is just dynamic and, and awesome, and, and we, were, we were really happy to get past it. Uh, so that's interesting. So then how do you take that now of, hey, what, now we've we've reached the summit. Maybe we're not the best team. How do we internalize that and build forward? So so that that is the, what, what the pragmatic part is of, of continuing to move and get better day by day. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, was uh, the Business Bible of the 90s, and it was called Good to Great. And the first line of that book said, good is the enemy of great. And it went on to say that the reason we have so, so few great companies in North America is because we have so many good ones and good is the enemy of great. In other words, we can be intoxicated by good. And, uh, but if we don't keep moving forward and trying to, to work, we, we find that we fall off. Right. And, and, uh, and that's something in Toronto that we don't want to do. Our biggest thing is, is be playing consistent football. We won in 2017. Uh, but after that, we had a couple of very difficult seasons, uh, you know, two seasons that didn't amount to 10 w- wins in total. And, and so consistent with that, uh, we and, you know, for, for the product in uh, in the Toronto, in the GTA area, uh, it's very important that we are able to maintain that level of consistency. What was the reception like? I saw videos, parades, and, you know, Enoch Mwambas at hockey games and stuff. I mean, what was it like a, we're coming home as a Grey Cup champs? Uh, it, it, you know, it, it always exceeds your expectations, right? Uh, the, uh, level of kindness and generosity, the, the faithfulness of so many fans and, and, and it just continues on, you know, so far past the, the, the date of, of, of that game. And, uh, it is, is one of those sustainable wins, uh, that people speak to, um, you know, people will come up, you know, today and, and, uh, uh, and, and say, wow, the game was so, and, and, and that's, that's what you want. And, and really for us, that's what we need in the city of Toronto. 
Uh, in terms of kind of rebuilding now for next year, so, you know, some question marks, right? We talked about McLeod on the show and the love that we have for him. Uh, if, you know, I, I think it's still kind of up in the air what he's doing regardless. Uh, how are you guys kind of looking to fill that position? I know we have Swag, uh, Chad Kelly in there as well as part of the equation. <laughs> what are we looking at under center? Uh, so we, we would be very comfortable right with either one of those guys uh and and um chad is under contract uh and and uh and and we're kind of waiting to see uh he had an injury that took him out of that game and he's already had surgery on that and so um one of the things is physically is he able right to you know to do all the things and the feeling is yes there's not going to be a problem there right but then um he, like um, uh, another guy, Andrew Harris, right, has multiple opportunities and, you know, are, are thinking through, you know, you know what, what, what is the best route from here? And are there all the opportunities I have available to me today, w- will they be what, uh, still available a year from now or two years from now if I continue to play? And so um, th- those, you know, both of those guys are in super positions and we will try to exercise patience with them. But at the same time, we will continue to just try to build um, uh, the team that we have until we get an answer uh, for the, from those guys. Hey, yeah. So regardless of what happens with McLeod, right. You know, you, like you said, you have uh, Chad, you know, Swag Kelly here on your contract. Uh, just curious your thoughts with him coming into the game late. You know, he came into the CFL with a lot of, you know, uh, vibrato and you're very excited and he's better than the NFL quarterbacks. All that, like uh, bringing that confidence, translating it to the field. What was that like? Uh, you know, to, to, to see him, to see that happen, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a story where you would love to have seen McLeod be able to get that first victory, having been in there the whole, you know, uh, the whole season and, and had, having been here for five years now. Uh, so, so, you know, you miss that side of it. But but to see him be able to come in and and make the big play of the game, which was the scramble, um, uh, I, I thought was probably the biggest play uh, of the game. And and, uh, and then uh, be able to continue to move on to 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 lead us to that win. Um, that that's you know yeah I mean he, he you know he's a he's a very confident guy, uh, but that can do nothing but help him moving forward. What was that locker room like following that game win? I mean, I have to imagine it was just out of control. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, every time gets richer, right? It's you know, um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, every, every time it seems so fresh and new, uh, like it's never happened before, and and uh, it's euf- euphoric out of body ex- uh, experience. They're pouring perfectly good beverage all over one another, <laughs> totally nonsensical, and. Uh, uh, but, you know, as, as a part of that, there are also those moments, uh, that happen, you know, little conversations that you have, um, with, with, with guys, uh, in that moment where, you know, they're kind of, you know, talking about, you know, uh, the weight that may have been lifted off of their shoulders or, you know, how, how, how good it is to, you know, I, you know, I've never won a championship before. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so, um, it, it, it it's one of those kind of indescribable things. Uh, um, it is very out of body in in one ways and very personal in others. As there are those times where you have those uh, more intimate moments where where guys are are, are sharing their heart. Uh, speaking of someone, you know, finally kind of getting to the top of the mountain, you know, we have Brandon Banks, right? Obviously, you guys, you know, kind of one and done at least. So what was that like to be able to give him that and have him be a part of that team? Wow, you know I, that that young man I love, and, and uh, I was a big fan before he came to us, and uh, would often, you know, kind of, you know, even though he's he's our arch rival, I would often go over to him after the game, you know, when he just beat us again, uh, and, and and you know, just you know, tell him how much I admired him, and and uh, you know, he he's done a lot of work uh, with uh, young people in community uh, as well, 
both uh, in Canada and back home. Uh, and, and so just really have a lot of admiration for him and his story and, and what he's gone through. And then to be able to see him uh, get that championship victory, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was awesome. Yeah, just, yeah, one, one, of those, uh, one of those memories, one of those things that you'll never forget. Uh, you know, following up, you know, all the you know parades, celebrations, everything. I think we talked to when you were on the show before, kind of raising the Argos profile in Toronto, right? And there, you know, there's yeah. all this everything that goes along with that. But do do you feel like having this next Grey Cup, you know, having it, adding another one on there here, recent? Are we going to be able to build on that in terms of getting more profile visibility for the team in the city? I think uh, of uh, of. One of the the things that will add to this, and and um, and we have to be careful not to make it about yesterday and more about today, is that our 150th anniversary uh, is this year. The Argonauts were founded in 1873, originally a rowing club that played rugby during the off season to stay in shape, uh, and eventually. Yeah, the Great Cup came came uh, around several years later uh, in 1909, uh, and it was given to the championship of the National Rugby Union. So we were still rugby players at that time, and uh, and so the great history uh, that we have, and and uh, being able to bring some of the great players in history uh, back this year, um, you know that combined with being able to, you know, to honor the guys with the championship banner, uh, having the 150th anniversary, we have to make sure that that 150th anniversary is, is about today, not yesterday, though. So we can't get caught into yesterday. It has to be about today and moving forward. It is hard. It's the greatest strength and weakness, I think, of the CFL is you have this illustrious history and in, in so much more than any of the other leagues that we cover on the show. But then right. you do people get a little hamstrung sometimes. Well, we don't want too much change or we don't want that. I mean, how do you balance that? Um, you know, I, I, I think you have to you, you have to continue to push. Right. And and challenge. And and those uh, there, there will be the ones who are you know more conservative, uh, who, who want to protect yesterday. And so they'll have their voice. And so that we'll, we'll always have that pushing against to balance. But we do have an, to have enough of us uh, that are, are, are moving forward and and, and challenging uh, the traditional. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to have Coach Dinwiddie on here in a little bit. Talk about the confidence you have in him and the rest of the coaching staff, everybody else moving forward. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, the we talked about it the day um, that we hired him, uh, about him. Being, he's just been around the game for so long, and he loves it. Uh, he he actually got zipped up in a, in a, a ball bag. <laughs> I think we talked about that before. We got it zipped up in a ball bag. And uh, uh, luckily, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't remember the details of, of exactly what took place, but his dad was a coach, and, and he's lived that. And, and, uh, and so <clears throat> his – level of competence, right, is unspeakable. But what, what really is neat to see um, his humanity, right, the, the way uh, the team was able to connect with him this year. And, and um, uh, because, you know, th- those who have been around him knows that he he's just a guy that likes to have fun. And, and uh, but he's very serious when he's out on the field. I think this year uh, the players got a chance to see Ryan Dinwiddie the man uh, more so uh, this year than the year before when we were dealing with a pandemic and a shortened season and all the different challenges there. Uh, they really uh, had a chance to see uh, Ryan Dinwiddie, uh, the, the, not just the coach, uh, but the person, the man, and the guy who is, you know, one of the best teammates that you'll ever have. I'm keeping my eye on the clock here. Before I let you go, you know, touchdown Atlantic coming up again. You guys get a you know key point in that, the excitement for that, and, and anything else. You talked about the 150 year celebration, but you know, a lot of cool milestones this year we're going to be having for the Argos, right? There is, and uh, and and we need to make sure that we build on this and do a great job of integrating both the old and the new. Uh, how how do you hold yourself that that you're going to help do that? Uh, well, we, we've already got a couple of things that I'm, I'm a part of in terms of the, the first game and, and navigating how we're uh, going to be bringing uh, young people into uh, that initial game, uh, that, that first game of the year. Um, and 
uh, as well, you know, I think my, my biggest responsibility is to make sure that we're uh, competitive as a football team. And so we, we're working hard towards that already. And, and, uh, um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about the year ahead. There, there uh, are a lot of uh, things. And so we, we need to make sure that those things don't become distractions for us, but additions. You're a confident guy, I have to imagine, as the reigning Grey Cup champion. That has to help going into the offseason and team building, right? Uh, you, you know, that that absolutely helps. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the thing that we have to be cognizant of it is, is it also hurts, right? Right? This is 2023. We were the champions in 2022, right? We, we, we have to now move on and play like champions, prepare like champions. We need to do the little things that are necessary in the off season before you arrive, right? Because we could lose, right? Even before training camp starts, if we don't get the same level of commitment in the off season and the different things. So uh, we, uh, we will make sure that we uh, communicate often with our guys and, and uh, try to uh, keep them motivated and encouraged so that we can be uh, a more consistent team as we move forward. Well, I really appreciate your time today. Busy day. Appreciate you taking the time. It's good to catch up with you again. Thank you so much. A hundred percent of time. A pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm thrilled today. Uh, Grey Cup winning head coach Ryan Dibbity. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. Just uh, enjoying, you know, getting back to Alberta and seeing the mountains and, uh, you know, look forward to these league meetings. Yeah, we were talking, enjoying the, the off-season beer growth. You said you haven't shaved since Grey Cup. I haven't shaved since the Grey Cup. It's been nice. Uh, you know, I haven't got a haircut yet either and uh, probably need need both. But uh, just kind of enjoying it, you know, uh, just uh, enjoying my time off and, I usually grow out a beard each winter, so it's uh, it's been pretty uh, neat for me to do it again, especially after winning a great cup. Well, yeah, when you're the big man here in the league right now, I think you can kind of call the shots. Congrats on the win. We were there up in Saskatchewan, uh, you know, frigid night for us Seattle folk, but it was fun. Uh, what was it like, just the experiences of going, going through all that and, and kind of the crazy ending to the game and everything else? Well, I think just kind of how it ended, right? Yeah. Um, we felt like we had the game one for the most part with the sack and then we get the face mask and then, you know, they battle back and we had the interception with Enoch before that drive. And we felt like we were going to finish it, you know, right there on their end. And it, it just, it was neat to see that our players, you know, the, the way that it ended and the way that they handled the moment, you can see the, the growth um, throughout the 18 games and then the two playoff games. Yeah, just remarkable. And, you know, we cover and we talk with a lot of writers that cover and you have this Winnipeg team that's kind of like they've been doing this and it's, they're building this franchise legacy, whatever it is here, Argos come in and kind of just like grab everyone by the shoulders on the sidelines. Like we got to go for this. We got to we got to make our stand here. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, playing against Winnipeg, they've been there, done that. They they played in big moments. I, I thought it was a chance for our, our club to show some growth and and so that, you know, they're uh, available to, to make those same strides. And you know, I feel like, you know, this year was a, a big year for us. And, you know, we kind of look back on the year before that, you know, there were some lost opportunities and, and we knew that going into it. And I think that lingered into the start of our season that, you know, we kind of knew that. And, you know, there was some some frustration, you know, on the sidelines and different things. And you know, we finally moved past that and grew together and, you know, that's what championship teams do. And, you know, I feel like, you know, some of those guys really matured as men and, and football players. Uh, for you kind of coming in, obviously the COVID year, and then we come back and it's all messed up. And now finally having kind of the first full season under your tenure, how nice was that to be able to go through that start to finish? Yeah, it was great. You know, other than the strike to start off training camp, yeah. you know, other, other than that, it was pretty fluid, uh, you know, for us. And uh, it, it was just, it was nice to just, kind of get back to it right not wearing masks on the sidelines not wearing masks in the meetings just let's just go back to playing football and a little bit of normalcy of what we're used to in our lives and um yeah it was a great season and uh you know very rewarding um wasn't easy but you know guys in our building found ways to stick together and look to the process of it and, and, and knew it was going to take a you know full team game full 18 games and then you know the the three playoff games and you know luckily we only had to play in two of them 
I know we hear a lot of people poo pooing and you know Toronto, and they don't care about all this. I saw your guys' celebrations looked crazy. You know, on the seeing Enoch at hockey games and everyone kind of parading the streets. What was it like living through all that after the celebration? Well, it was pretty neat. I think the city rallied behind us and um, really respected what we did for them um, and, and how much we appreciate the city. And, you know, we want to have a full stadium every week. And, you know, that's not always going to be the case. And that's not the case in any organization. But, you know, we we want them to feel good about us. And uh, when we talk about the Argos, go, oh, those you know, those guys are really you know, playing good football and doing good things in the community. And, and um you know, we, we try to do that. And that's what the pinball is here to do is, you know, fi- find a way to, you know, get these guys involved in the community. And MLC does a great job with it. You know, get us to a hockey game, get us to a basketball game. You know, I, I mean, I probably got to make one phone call. They'll give me some tickets. I don't try to do it too often. But uh, j- just the the opportunity to go to a Raptors game and the Leafs game is pretty unique. And I don't think a lot of cities, you know, offer that. And we do. And, um, you know, <laughs> they have the same owners we do. And uh, so that's, that's the nice part about it. And, you know, now let's keep winning and, and get some more seats, you know, filled in that stadium. Uh, I just talked to pinball here before I got on with you. It had really kind words to say about you and just the growth that he feels like, you know, last year, like you were saying with the COVID protocols and everything, just kind of, we're trying to get by right. Where this year he felt like the players were able to see you kind of grow as a man and as a leader among the team. Uh, you know, hearing that from someone, you know, obviously one of your, you know, coworker, whatever, you know, whatever the, the relationship is, but a legend of the game like that, how does that feel? It feels great. And, you know, me and pinball have had a great, working relationship from the get-go on you know i think year one was kind of learning experience and i think the way we ended the year before losing the eastern final really sat home with me and i felt like we weren't disciplined in it it didn't sit right with me and and it lingered into the the next season and i probably wasn't that easy to work with um probably took a different approach and you know i felt like i lost the players a little bit with with that approach so you know it was about i don't know week six or week seven i'm like man I, i can't you know, I can't, I got, I got to find a way to, to find a message to these guys in a different light. And, uh, we did that and we came together and then we became a football club and working towards the same goal. And yeah, it, you learn as a young coach and you know, how, how to approach certain players in certain locker rooms and, you know, each organization is different. You know, I kind of brought my Calgary hat on and, you know, there's the expectations and it's a little bit different. Well, we're, we're, we're a different club in Toronto and, um, you know, I got to handle our players a little bit differently. And once I gave them the respect and, um, you know, that, Hey guys, it's kind of on you. I'm not going to be a, a butthead anymore. Let's, let's get going. And, um, this is what we need to do to win. And, you know, everybody kind of, you know, join in on that thought and, and, and move forward and, you know, work their butts off to make sure that they're working for their, their teammates as well. Here off season, you know, you know, Saskatchewan's hiring people. We have all this mishmash, and you know, there, there's always this talk of like the level of coaching in the CFL, and you know, is, is the cap or good enough, whatever. Uh, when we were at Grey Cup, what struck me from looking at Winnipeg and Toronto, two phenomenally coached, right staff organizations from top to bottom. What do you make of the the level of coaching in the CFL right now? Well, I, I think it's at its best. Um, you know, I, I've been in the league since 2005, and when I was a player, I wasn't very impressed with some of the coaches that I, that I was around. And, you know, there's, there were some really good coaches I was around, but just as a whole, I didn't feel like, you know, there were some guys just like, what is this guy? Like, how's this guy got a coaching job? And I think now you look at it, it's like now, you know, you're going to lose coaches. You know, I mean, there's really good coaches across the board, and, and I feel really good about my staff. And, um, and, and this coach's cap thing's tough, and I can't reward guys for doing a good job and, and where we're at, which is unfortunate. But, you know, I think we got to get away from that if we want to keep good coaches in our country and in our league. And, um, you know, guys make sacrifices to move up from the States you know, or move from, let's say, Montreal to Saskatchewan to coach there, or, or, you know, just an example. But, you know, guys move away from their families for six months, and, you know, I think they should be paid, you know, a little bit better than what we're paying our coaches. And we have a good league. and. Uh, we already know we have great players, but now I feel like we have great organizations and great coaches to to match that. Uh, speaking of players, a couple guys on on your team, and I know future is uncertain, McLeod and and everything else. But we've tracked him all the way through the off the COVID year and came down here, played in the states in San Antonio, and that was kind of crazy. Like, what do you make of him as a leader and and just as someone that finally kind of got his shot this year? 
Yeah, I think, you know, he's been through a, a long journey. You know, he's been cut multiple times. And I think, you know, the reason why he's been cut in the NFL so many times is, you know, opportunity. Did he really get one? But you look at his skill set. I mean, the ball jumps out of his hand. And that was the one thing that, you know, really intrigued me about taking this job and, and working with him. I, I could I could see it from, you know, from the sideline working for another club. And uh, his leadership's, you know, um, infectious. He brings guys along and, and, you know, and all the stuff he did with, you know, dealt with last year, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, one-year-old daughter, his brother-in-law gets, you know, hurt in a car accident the day before one of our preseason games and his wife's, you know, taking a job in Atlanta for six months and they're going back and forth. It, it, it was tough. And you just look at his mental toughness and what he had to overcome last year with all the circumstances and then play his best season. Uh, pretty impressive. Well, that's the thing too. I mean, it's, it's hard enough if you're in, in the NFL or in the States and to be away from your family and be separate. I just don't think people appreciate that enough. And like almost how isolating that is, right? Like I had I'm up in the you know, Canada right now, we got the bye weeks and stuff, but not able to kind of do the things that maybe I'd be able to do normally. Yeah. And, and they don't understand the circumstances with it. Right. Like now I'm getting my oldest son, you know, he's going into um, preschool and kindergarten and you know, let's, let's say, you know, I don't plan on leaving, but if I had had to take a job, well, I'm sure if I take a job someplace, you know, we're still going to have him in school and keep that house and then get a separate house. And it's, 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 it's tough and it's, it's part of the business, but you know, um, very rewarding business and you, you got to make sacrifices, but th at the same time, you understand, you know, what those have to be from time to time. Uh, thoughts on uh, Chad Kelly came into the CFL kind of shot out of a cannon here. Very excited, very you know bombastic online. Thoughts of him coming into the Grey Cup and just everything about Sway Kelly. Well, I mean, you know, the guy's got high expectations and he, he works his butt off. And, uh, you know, he's had a great career in the States at the college level. Didn't really get a chance to play too much in the NFL. And, uh, yeah, I mean. He came up and he played well for us at times, did a great job with the short yardage. Uh, you know, we got to see him make some more throws, but we feel like we can win with Chad. We feel comfortable with Chad. Uh, I feel like he's matured as a, as a man. Um, still got some things where we got, we got to see as far as development, as far as being a franchise quarterback. But let's say McLeod retires tomorrow. We feel good about Chad and we'll bring some competition uh, to compete with him in camp because you don't just give, uh, you know, franchise quarterback jobs away. You got to, they, they got to be earned. Um, but I, I feel like he can earn it. I feel like he can be a franchise guy. You know, as obviously someone working with quarterbacks and you know, Bo Levi, kind of everything else, I, we've talked before on the show that transition, obviously now we have the XFL, USFL here, and players wanting to get shots there versus it really is a two, three, four-year, you know, kind of process to kind of get up to speed in the CFL. We've seen Cornelius here with the Elks kind of potentially take the next step. Why is it uh, for you that, that that building process to get to be a successful CFL quarterback, why is that so challenging? Well, I think it's, you, you got to have some time. You know, I think when you throw a guy on the field so early, um, you know, you kind of ruin them. And, and you got to have a foundation to, to, to mold younger quarterbacks, right, and make it quarterback friendly and, and have, a, have a plan with that. So um, I feel like, you know, some of the younger quarterbacks I've been with, you know, you keep a simple form and, and, and give them a chance to succeed and, you know, play good defense, good special teams. And then eventually, you know, you give them more, more, more on their plate to, you know, win the football game. But – you know, I, I think um, it's a tough league. It's, you know, 12 guys, a lot of motion. It's different. It's in um, certain guys can handle it. Certain guys can, and uh, you've got to have a little athleticism to you to play in this league. You know, um, it's, it's different than the NFL. And I, and I think, you know, a lot of the, the quarterbacks who used to make it to the CFL are now sticking down South. So, um, you know, the skill sets kind of change as far as what they're looking for. They're kind of, you know, looking at the same things we are, but, yeah, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I still feel like we have good quarterbacks in our league, and you know we got to continue to find some more, and um, yeah, and, and develop them and coach them properly to give them a chance to to win on game day. How do you think the league can? And that's more of a broader range of questions. But how do you think the league can kind of more uh, attract those players and quarterbacks up here with all the competition? Oh, I think financially we have to have a plan for that. You know, um, you know, maybe you take some of the quarterback salaries and you know, kind of keep them separate from the rest of the, the club and uh, find ways to pay them a little bit more to keep them from these other leagues and, and um, know that they have a bright future up there. And, you know, you know maybe you have them kind of, you know, for, first string quarterback can make this amount of money, you know, and second string quarterback, we got to pay over a hundred grand and, you know, third string quarterback, we're going to pay him 85 to make, you know, 125 because 
I mean, guys aren't going to come up here for 65 grand. Um, there's new leagues and, and that used to be the case. Yeah. Cause there was, there wasn't another league guys wanted to play football. So they would come up and be a third stringer for 65 grand. But I mean, even, even a hundred grand, I think, you know, that, that might be the, the minimum to pay your, your third string quarterback. And you know, let's, let's invest in it. Let's, let's see how it goes. Uh, mindful of time here before I let you go, just, you know, moving forward here, building ahead, next steps for you guys. What are you looking forward to? Yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of seeing what, you know, free agency is going to go. I, I don't think we'll be, you know, as, um, I guess as aggressive as we've been in the last two years, I feel like we got to be more aggressive side our guys and, you know, let's find the right guys that are on our club that we want to bring back. And, you know, let, let's go get two or three guys from, you know, other teams we feel like that we can add and, and help us. And then we got to go scout our butt off and go find, you know, six, seven rookies that come in and training camp and, and try to take some of these guys' jobs and, and go from there. So uh, you got to have competition in training camp. It, it's vital. And um, I'm looking forward to that this year. We, we can't just, you know, say, hey, we won the Great Cup. We're going to redo it again. And we got to have competition. And uh, some guys got to, you know, go elsewhere. We'll see how that's going to play out. Uh, well, we're excited. Congrats again. Looking forward to the future. Hopefully we'll see you. We'll be in Hamilton and hopefully we see you guys defending up there uh, next year. I appreciate it. Awesome. Sounds good, man. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I was just told that this would probably be my favorite interview of the day. We have Craig Dickinson here with the Rough Riders. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, first off, have you recovered from, we were in Regina, Winnipeg logo being painted on the end zone that had to be quite traumatic. Yeah, boy, that was tough. Yeah, it's taken me a couple a couple weeks, but I think I'm over it and uh, ready to move on. Excited about 2023 for sure. Yeah. Is it, you know, with the season like last year, is it easier just to kind of move on? How do you approach that? How do you compartmentalize that? Well, the nice thing, the nice thing about being a little older, I'm in my fifties now is you, you, you know, you've kind of seen it and done it a, a little bit, right? We've been through good seasons where you never want them to end. And we've been through tough seasons where, you know, they can't get over soon enough. And last year, honestly, was kind of a, a little bit of both. We started off really well. We were four and one at one point, felt like we had a good team and a good, a good group of guys. And then the wheels just kind of fell off, you know, and they did did so kind of uh, on a week to week basis. Unfortunately, we, but uh, you know, we were able to think about that as a, as a football operations department, as a coaching staff, figure out what went wrong. How can we, how can we do better next year to try to address it so that if the same things happen, we got answers for it. And and I feel like we did a good job, a real good deep dive into the season after the season was over. And I think we're ready to hit the ground running in 2023. Yeah. So, I mean, we're newer to covering the CFL. All that I know, you know, Saskatchewan runs the league, you know, one of the, you know, premier kind of franchises, right. And your fan base and everything else. So, you know, when I lived through a season like last year, you know, it certainly doesn't feel like the norm, right? No, we're this is a proud organization and a proud franchise. And and whenever you're watching the playoffs going on without you being in it, it's a disappointment. So, you know, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves. I know the people that I work with, you know, the football ops people and, and management from the top, Craig Reynolds, all the way down. We're ready to really get to work this off season and figure out a way to make sure that we can have an improved season, make sure that we can get back into the, into the playoffs and really, really push for a championship. Cause that's, that's what we're, that's what our goal is. That's what we're all about is trying to win championships. And we feel like we are uh, an organization that should be able to do that year in, year out. Hey, I'm going to have Jeremy O'Day on later as well. You do feel like, you know, where it's maybe not the most ideal last, uh, you know, last season, you are able to, to roll that forward more. It almost gives you more momentum moving forward. I think so. You know, you learn from everything, right? So you learn from good, you learn from bad, and hopefully we can learn from things that didn't go the way we wanted them to and make, you know, take the emotional element out of it, so to speak, and just learn and make sure that we, uh, you know, we structure our team and we we structure how we do things in such a way that we can weather those bumps. Because every team's going to have them. Every team has bumps, Reed, and, and the better you can be at it, just kind of – riding through them like being in a big old monster truck handling the good with the bad you know the better your chances are to be where you want to be at the end so i i think last year's nothing more than a learning experience hopefully a, a bump in the road and hopefully we can make changes and improve on it 
So what are you looking forward to? Biggest, biggest things? I mean, I know people are always talking about the O-line, you know, quarterback things. I mean, where are you guys targeting here moving forward? Well, it's that is the, I mean, that's the truth. Uh, we got to get better up front. I think O-line probably is our priority. Got to get, got to get a lot better at our tackle positions, both our tackles. And then I think we got to, we got to solidify our interior three as well. I mean, we, we just weren't good enough up front. And I think that led to a lot of the problems you saw across the board. Quarterback's going to be a you know the the marquee position in, on our field as well as any other league, and we're going to have to do a good job of making sure our quarterbacks number one comfortable in the system we're going to run, and number two feels like they you know have their best football ahead of them. So those are our two big big uh, big challenges in this off season is is O line and quarterback, and we've already honestly been been working on them for the past month. Yeah, obviously, you know, Mason Fine there bringing in, are you going to be bringing in a lot of people to compete for that position? Do you feel good with Mason? We're going to, it's going to be, <laughs> excuse me, it's going to be wide open at quarterback. We we feel like we're going to, we're going to bring in a good veteran quarterback, whether that means we re-sign Cody or we go find a, a free agent and re-sign him or, and sign him to a contract. We're going to have a good veteran quarterback that's going to come in and we're going to hopefully have good young talent to compete with and Mason being one of those young players, uh, Jake Dolagala being one of those players. We feel like we put the best three or four quarterbacks that we can find out on the field in training camp and let, you know, let them play and let the, the cream rise to the top. That's what we're, what we're planning on doing. I apologize for asking just because I'm sure you've had a thousand questions about this all season. And obviously we've never, uh, you know, Cody Fajardo to me is an outsider. It just seems like the most fascinating situation in the world. I've never seen somebody that seems so amenable, hardworking, you know, works hard, but yet there's just always stuff going on with that. I mean, what is Cody like as a person? I mean, you spent, you know, how many years that I just, yeah. do you get what I'm saying from an outsider? I just, it, it always seems odd to me. Well, Cody is what you what you described—a really outstanding person, hard worker, cares a lot about football, good family man. Just had a young a young baby, him and his wife, um, and he, he's he's a good dude, and 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 he's a good football player. I think a lot of the stuff you see on the outside, honestly, is a is a product of Saskatchewan. <laughs> I mean, the the sketch Saskatchewan Rough Riders are a different organization, and that the the fan base is so passionate. And so connected to the team that I think you get sometimes a lot of the good you get is all these outside uh, opportunities. And then sometimes you get outside distractions because of it. So um, I think Cody's a good football player. I don't think he's any different than anybody else in the quarterback position and that he's got a, you know, a lot of weight on his shoulders, but at the same time, the quarterback gets probably more credit they, they than they deserve when you win and probably more blame than they deserve when you lose. And Cody, Cody has seen both of those. Is it more challenging to be a quarterback in Saskatchewan than the other eight teams up in, in the CFL? I think so. I think you got to have a little thicker skin. And, and I just think there's just more opportunities for distraction, even though Saskatchewan is relatively small place, you're not going to get in too much trouble off the field, but there's just a lot of, there's a lot of noise. And, uh, and we're going to work hard as an organization to make sure that our players understand the noise is the noise and it's your choice whether you want to listen to it or not. But here's the way we're going to do things. And uh, and we don't make our decisions based on what what um, John Q. Public is saying they have. We respect and appreciate the input that the public has, but we're not basing our decisions based on that. Yeah, I we were up at Grey Cup. I will tell you candidly, very terrified to bring my wife from Seattle up to Regina <laughs> in the middle of winter. Uh, I really had the lowest of expectations and really was floored by just the hospitality and everything else. I mean, it really was an awesome time. But yeah, it's going into it very, very worried about that. Yeah, it's good. It's a good place in the CFL. I'm glad. I'm glad you're diving into the league. It's a wonderful league. I I grew up in Montana. I coached in the NCAA ranks. Coached in the NFL and been in Canada now 15 years and it's it's really unique special and it's a great league and I'm I'm thrilled to see more US folks like yourself coming up and and taking an interest in the league cuz it's a good one Absolutely. Uh, you know, speaking of just it, kind of the noise and, and you know, bringing in, I want to talk about the new offensive coordinator as well. But, it, you know, it, do you feel like the Rough Riders still a desirable, pl desirable place to play, to coach at? Is it still a desirable franchise there? Oh, yeah. I still feel like 
you know, we're, we're going to have a down year every once in a while. It just is what it is. Some, some, some years are better than others. We, we certainly don't want to have a down year, but it's still, I think, still one of the marquee uh, best places to coach. The support is, is off the charts. Um, fans care. And because of that, sometimes you'll hear it if, if you're not doing well, but I'll tell you what, you, I'll take uh, fan engagement over apathy any day. And we definitely have fan engagement here. And uh, for good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to hear from the granny at the grocery store when you drive in because she's going to know who you are and she's going to have an opinion on the team. And to me, I, I just think that's a great situation. Well, I think I think once people yeah, exactly if if they're quiet, then they don't care. It's definitely a factor of having passion that way. Uh, uh, changes, you know, bringing in a new offensive coordinator, uh, exciting for that. What kinds of things are we looking forward yeah, to? Yeah, you know, Kelly's a guy I've known for a few years, but I haven't haven't given him the keys or given him a lot of responsibility necessarily. But I, I just think he's a, a he's a really sharp guy, very emotionally intelligent. I think he relates well to people. Um, and I feel like we're doing a pretty good job of building a good staff around him. So you're, you're going to see a new look offense and what it's going to look like exactly. I can't tell you because they're still in the process of molding and shaping it. But I do think Kelly's going to bring a lot of nice ideas to the table. I think um, I think we've got a good staff. We still got a few positions to fill, but I think we're going to have a good, solid staff. And it's going to be kind of a fresh start for all of us, which is exciting. Uh, what do you make of the level of coaching talent right now in the CFL? It's been a conversation and different job hirings and everything else. How, how do you make the level of that? And, uh, you know, is, is it still a desirable league for quality players who want to come coaching? I think it's still very high. Um, you know, they, you're going to get challenges like, like you get at our play. We just lost our D line coach, young guy, a good young, I would say probably a young up and coming star in coaching and it's just, we just can't pay him enough to keep him sometimes. And that's just the reality of it. Um, but the business model that I think is, has been built for the CFL is based on, you know, making sure that the costs are at least predictable. And, and the reality is the young coaches, you're going to lose a good young coach once in a while, just like the NFL loses a good young coach once in a while, or just like an, and every once in a while, you're going to lose one because somebody else is going to pay him more to do the same thing. And, and it fits more of what they're looking for. But I think in general, to answer your question, the CFL is a very desirable place to work. Um, you get to coach really the best athletes in the world. And they're different athletes in the NFL, but athletically, they're phenomenal. They can do things that the other guys just can't do. And, and I think the fan engagement and the loyalty that each city and group has to their team, it just, it just leads for a lot of neat rivalries and really great experiences. So I think the CFL is arrow is pointing up and I think it's just going to get better. Uh, last question. What, you know, what should fans of the team be looking forward to here? Like you said, new look offense, you know, bringing in quarterback seems like a lot of change, right? Change is good. I mean, even for Rough Rider fans, it's good sometimes to do that. So what should people expect looking forward? Yeah, a lot of change. So expect the unexpected would be, would be an answer. I expect uh, a lot of new faces on the offensive line. Uh, expect a little different offense in terms of what it's going to look like. I think you're going to see a little more emphasis uh, running the football, although I felt last year we did a decent job running. Uh, and then I think just just some new faces coaching. I think that's one of the things that's going to be fun for the, the casual fan to come to a practice and see different guys coaching. And I think chances for guys like Kelly Jeffrey and new, new young coaches to really put their stamp on on the team and and, uh, and give it their own distinct flavor. So. Lots of changes, but hopefully a lot of good athletes. We're looking to get really athletic at receiver, uh, physical up front. And uh, and I can't tell you who the quarterback's going to be, but he's going to be throwing the ball a lot. Well, it'll be good, people. You know, some of the I saw some of the Ryder fans upset because of some of the game schedules, and I got it. But they'll have a good team here to support. We'll make sure everybody's <laughs> happy. I know change is difficult sometimes, but I think it should be good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the season. appreciate the visit. Thank you very much, Greg. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, we have Jeremy O'Day here uh, with the Rough Riders. Uh, just came back from beautiful Regina here back at Grey Cup. How was, obviously not in the Grey Cup, but kind of witnessing the Winnipeg takeover, everything else. How did you cope with all that? Uh, very difficultly, to be honest. It was tough to, tough to see, but, um, you know, that's the tough part of having a game uh, at home when you're, when you're not in it. Um, it, you know what people don't understand is what's so what's so difficult is the, the amount of work that you're 
that your own team puts into hosting a, a gray cup and the, and the amount of work, even, even when you go back and you think about how they have to bid for the, the gray cup in order to receive it, our, our staff, we just did a, a heck of a job bidding for it. And we actually were supposed to have it in 2020 and it actually got pushed back because of COVID. Right. So um, that's the tough part is, is you're, you're obviously disappointed. Your football team uh, isn't in the game, but you, you know how much work went into it. And then, and then, uh, you know, then an opposing team comes in and they're, they're in your locker room during the game. That's, you know, that's, a, that's a tough one to swallow too. So, um, but uh, I just, I, I thought the, the, the presentation and, and the setup of the great cup, I thought it was awesome. And it was all in one, one room and I'm a little bit biased, but that, that Ryderville was, was unbelievable. The size of that, that venue was, was monstrous. And I, I saw a lot of people having a lot of fun in there. Yeah, because we went to Hamilton and everyone said, well, that's not real. You got to go. And this. So now we went to Regina. So at some point we'll attend a real, you know, I, I go. <laughs> but, yeah, there's always this like, well, it needs to be whatever. But, no, it was fun. And we had a great time there and got to see the sights and sounds. It's a uh, it's a cool spot. I have very low expectations heading into Regina. But my wife and I had a lot of fun. Well, good. I'm good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, the rider season uh, here, how would you grade A to, a to F the 2022 season? Oh, a numerical. A- anything, anytime you're, you're not, you don't put yourself uh, to be in the playoffs and get an opportunity to be in the last game. I think it's a, it's a failure to be honest with you. So, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be ever be a guy that would evaluate us uh, any higher than if you didn't, uh, didn't accomplish that. Obviously there's lots of things that happen during the season. A lot of guys have some personal successes that you're happy for, and there's areas that you did good and there's areas that you did not so good. Um, but obviously uh, last year was, was not something that uh, was our expectation, certainly as our expectation moving forward and uh, something that uh, you don't really ever want to experience again. You want to have successful seasons and you want to be uh, have an opportunity to be in the playoffs and make a run at it because uh, once you're in the playoffs, uh, it's, it's anyone's game. Uh, biggest successes you can take away from the season, things you're proud about as an organization? Um, I think that uh, when you do it, you're, you're really looking at uh, individual play of some certain players on your team. I think that, uh, you know, some of the things that were neat to see, seeing Keenan Schaefer Baker establish himself as a, a top receiver in our, our league. Uh, Mario Alford coming over in a trade and uh, from, get, from getting traded to uh, from one team to another and being the uh, the most outstanding uh, special teams player is is an, an achievement, and um, we went through a lot of adversity, a lot of ups and downs. It's uh, it's it's really tough when you start the year off uh, strong and then it kind of fades away. It's it's really that's those are difficult seasons. Um, if you start off slow and then improve as the year goes, that's that's a sign of improvement. But when you're going the other way, that really is it takes a toll on it. So not something that you want to do. Um, certainly, uh, certainly want to improve on our season from last year. Uh, we're new to covering the CFL here the last couple of seasons. All I live in the world is, is, you know, Saskatchewan is the, you know, CFL Canada, CFL team and kind of the place to be. Uh, does that add extra pressure to you and being a part of that, knowing that this is kind of the lifeblood of the CFL up there? Um, you know what? I, I think, I think there's always pressure, uh, to, to be successful in your job. I think that, um, one of the things that's different in Saskatchewan is just it's just more public. I think there's more people uh, where it matters. Uh, football matters in Saskatchewan. I say it all the time, and um, people want to know what's going on with the Rough Riders. They want the team to be good. Um, they spend the money to come to the games. Uh, we got a great season ticket base, um, so their expectations are for us to do well. We we don't have any excuses not to be successful. We got a great stadium and and a great fan base, and so. Um, really, they just want something to be proud of uh, and take pride in. And, and that's what you're trying to do. Ultimately, uh, give them a team that they can they can feel proud about. And uh, that's what's difficult when you have a tough year, when you're when you're not being successful and uh, you don't make the playoffs is that uh, uh, Saskatchewan uh, kind of ticks to uh, the beat of uh, the Rough Riders season. Right. So you can see it uh, on a weekly basis. If we win games, the the mood of the city is different. And uh uh, and you certainly want to win those games because uh, it definitely puts people in a better mood. Coming off of the season, and like you said, you know, didn't end maybe the way you know you wanted it to. How do you approach now rebuilding? I mean, there's a lot of you know, and we'll go a couple different directions here, but a lot of areas that we need to work on as a team here in the off season. How do you even start kind of processing that? 
Yeah, right, right immediately. Uh, and honestly, you're, you're, you're kind of going through it during, during the season of, you know, where we feel like we're not playing, uh, that well at that, at a certain position or, or a certain group. And, and, um, you kind of know what you have to prove on and you, and you certainly are trying to improve that during the season, um, if you're able to, um, and, and there's times where you wonder, do we just need time to gel? Do you need time to improve, uh, in an area? And sometimes that, that works out where the, the guys kind of, uh, they figure it out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then when the season ends, you're, you're really gathering a lot of information from, from coaches and players and, and from your scouting staff of, Hey, here's the areas that we were deficient in. Um, here's some areas that we think we're, we're good at. And, uh, and then you start developing kind of your plan for the off season of, of how to, how to make the team better. Um, and then, and then a lot of that has to do with your free agency and going into the draft. Uh, I apologize for Craig for asking this too, because I'm sure that, you know, the Cody Fajardo question, you know, a lot, you know, I live through this as an outsider. It's, it's an anomaly to me as someone that is so uh, likable and it seems like, you know, uh, even keeled and family man. And we love all this, but it's so like marred in controversy all the time. Like, it's just a weird dichotomy for me where, you know, normally like in the NFL, you get these like bad boys that you get a lot of the press. What do you make of just the, the kind of, is it just because of Saskatchewan and that is the focal point as a quarterback? Like, why does Cody get so much uh, heat around him in that position? Yeah, that's just natural to Saskatchewan. It is a different place to to play and different place to to be the starting quarterback. There is a, there is a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, you can't go anywhere uh, without people giving you your opinion of it, um, and it's kind of always been that way. So it takes a it, it takes a lot um, uh, of adjusting, uh, and, and you got someone. Uh, Cody's such an open, honest, uh, honest person, wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, and there's a lot of people that, uh, if you, if you have a tough game, they're not nice about it. And, and that's just the reality of it in Saskatchewan is, is they're going to tell you how, how they feel and that could be good or bad. Um, and sometimes it makes it difficult. And, uh, when you take a lot of pride in what you do and, and, uh, your values and your beliefs, uh, it's hard, it's hard to take that. And and it's and it's been a long history of, of that in Saskatchewan. I can I can say that you have to you have to have have a certain uh, mindset when you're playing Saskatchewan. And I've I've known a lot of uh, starting quarterbacks from my time uh, here. And um, it takes uh, it, it's a unique challenge of being a starting quarterback in in Saskatchewan for sure because um, you got you got a lot of uh, a lot of coaches and a lot of GMs that that uh, that live in the province, but Again, I've said it a million times, and I truly mean it. Is uh, that's what makes it special, and uh, that's what makes Saskatchewan special. It means a lot, and you know what they say about uh, what they say about Sask it being a, a football town is is uh, is definitely true. I would rather be uh, in a city where where everyone's paying attention to it than a city where where not many people are paying attention to it. So uh, it's it's the good and the bad. Uh, shots fired against the Argos. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, and I've, I've, I, didn't, I didn't mention any names. <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, because I and I, I'm friends with a lot of the you know Saskatchewan media people, and you know they cover the team right. You know, every day more than I would ever hope to even know about all this. And you know, you get well, the quarterback can't succeed because the O line isn't there, or well, the O line isn't, and the quarterback, and now we bring in Mason Fine, all this kind of stuff. Like uh, moving into the off season, like how how are we approaching this? What are your thoughts on? Because it really is. Is kind of the most controversial situation I think of in terms of any of the nine teams right now. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I'm a big, big believer that in order to, to, to give yourself an opportunity to be successful, you have to be, uh, you have to be good up front on the offensive line. And I think that we, we definitely didn't, uh, didn't have a strong year up front. I think that early in the year, we, we, we did a nice job uh, running the football early, which helped us in the past game. And, and as, as we start the season started to go, I think that other teams started to stop the run, and um, you know there's a there's a bunch of variables that uh, that impacted how the season went and how the the struggles began. And um, you know Cody with uh, with getting the knee injury and uh, having to wear a big brace and and uh, that slowing down some of his mobility, which is a big part of his game, uh, definitely had an impact. Um, but you know everyone has to share responsibility. Uh, I certainly do. 
um, share, share, share responsibility in that. And really it's a group, it's a group effort to get it changed, right? Everyone just has to really take it personal. And, and, uh, you know, what I was proud of, proud about the guys not pointing fingers, uh, as things got tough, I thought the guys, I thought we faced a lot of adversity. You know, we had about a COVID, we had a, another virus that came in, uh, during another game where we had, uh, 20 or 30 guys that were, <laughs> were, were pretty darn sick during the game. Um, and, and then, uh, obviously, uh, some situations that, uh, uh, that were, that we're not super happy with that went on during the year. Um, but I thought that, that through all that, I thought the guys did stick together. Um, for the most part, there's, it's always a challenge. You got a room full of, of, of grown men that, that, uh, uh, it's not easy when, when things get tough, everyone handles it different ways. And, um, but overall, I thought the guys handled it as, as good as possible. And, really just want to get back to a season where we're, we're avoid, avoiding some of those situations and, and uh, really just focused in on football. Yeah, one of those uh, individuals signed down here in the USFL we'll get to cover here in April. So I'll be very curious how kind of all that works out with one of the big bad boys of the CFL here continuing on. Uh, is Saskatchewan uh, it's still a desirable team, franchise team, a team that people you know want to coach for, want to play for, want to be a part of? Yeah, I truly believe so. I think that, um, uh, you know, again, I'm, <clears throat> I'm certainly biased, um, but you talk to a lot of people and I think what, uh, what they grow to appreciate is just the environment that we have there. I think a lot of our players, uh, dream of, of playing in big stadiums in front of a lot of people. Um, you know, they want the excitement after a touchdown scored. Um, I think we do a heck of a job of, of our presentations of games and, uh, getting the fans involved with those things, and but it, but it has to work hand in hand. You have to have a team that they're they're proud about, and um, you know certainly um, when you have a good year, it's certainly uh, you'll you'll be more talked about by some of the other players about what a great place it is. And uh, if you struggle, then it becomes a little more challenging. But um, you know we're we're going to try to get back on the right track to to where we were in the past and. Uh, win, win football games and, and put herself in, in position in, in the end. Uh, last question for me, just uh, your your word to, you know, season ticket holders, passionate Saskatchewan fans. I know there was a lot of, you know, we got the schedule and all this, we're getting there, but people are going to be excited coming back. What is your message to them here heading into 2023? Yeah, just uh, the, the same message that I always give, give them is just to please continue to, to support our team. They, they, they've been uh, fantastic. Um, and I understand that they're frustrated with last season and, and, uh, just want to give them our word that we're, we're working our butts off to try to, uh, improve the team, give them a team that they, they can be proud of. Um, we certainly have, uh, the people in place that know the importance, uh, of, of putting a team together that they can be proud of, um, both on the field and off the field. Um, and, just to show that rider, that rider pride that they always have. And uh, rider nation's always been there. Um, and I hope that they'll, they'll continue to do that and come out and support us. And uh, we're going to do the best we can to have a great team for them. Uh, well, busy week for you, busy day for you. I appreciate you coming on and, and good luck with everything I was going to ask you about Kelly Jeffrey as well, but you know, a lot of excitement going on and I think this will be good. And I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time too. And it was, it was good talking to you. Busy day for you guys, huh? Yeah, busy. You know, we, we're out here uh, traveling out here in the morning and on a different time zone and then a whole bunch of media opportunities and a great time to talk football with all the coaches, GMs, presidents, and league office. So uh, it's a good time to have our swords down for lack of better term in the off season when no one's competing and, and really talk about trying to better the game. Uh, well, I really appreciate it here. Sean Burke uh, with the Ottawa Red Blacks. We have a, of all of our American listeners, I would say Ottawa probably carries some of the most, you know, popular in terms of fan support of our American listeners. So I appreciate your time today. Uh, league offices, everything going well, having a good off season. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously we, we faced a very important decision uh, when starting our off season, which was uh, hiring a head coach and, uh, uh, with doing that, then you can sort of set the blueprint of 
Bob putting his staff together and then uh, start signing players to your team. So uh, we started a little slow in the off season in terms of signings and then hit a flurry once we got our staff in place. And now we're trying to, to grind through some uh, before free agency opens and, uh, and then see what free agency brings. Uh, yeah, just got done pot talking with Bob here a few minutes ago. What ultimately led, obviously, coming in midseason, special teams in the interim, but to ultimately give him the keys here at the end of the season? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, leadership, uh, outstanding leader, uh, directs uh, men in a way uh, to inspire them and can cultivate uh, a culture in our room. And culture is often a word that's used a lot in sports. Uh, but it, you can't talk about it daily. It just you have to continuous, continuously expect it and set the expectations. And I felt Bob did that in the last four games. Secondly, just uh, game management. I think that's where a head coach makes a big difference. And having a special teams background, you're usually involved in that, that sort of thing. And then finally, the staff he could bring together. Uh, I felt the staff he was proposing, you're never going to hit 100% on all your staff members that's on your wish list. But he had a lot of uh, a lot of the ones that he said in the interview process to get two guys like Kahari and Barron on board as our coordinators uh, just gave us a great opportunity uh, to work with great people. And that's the final thing of it all is at the end of the day, a coach GM uh, relationship is a partnership and you want to be able to work with a great person. And I've been lucky enough to do that in in Hamilton with several head coaches. Um, have got to do it with Paul last year. Uh, no disrespect to Paul Lapolis. I, I had a great relationship with him and it was a tough decision that had to be made. And then ultimately working together with Bob over the last 365 days in his capacity then and now as a head coach, just really excited. Uh, thoughts on last year as a whole, obviously, um, Felt like a lot of momentum going into from the off season, you know, with you and we have Jeremiah. We're doing all these behind the scenes shows and everything. I just felt a lot of momentum never really translated on the field. I know Mazzoli getting hurt and all that. How do you look back at the season? Yeah, uh, I think be it NFL, CFL, NCAA. Uh, whenever you lose your number one guy, it makes things a little tougher. Uh, that 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 would definitely go without saying, but. The reality is we expect it to be a better football club and we have to deliver a better product on our field for, for our fan base. And that's ultimately, uh, besides ownership, who, who we're all accountable to is, is our fan base. And uh, it's not taken lightly, that responsibility. Uh, you know, we, we have expectations uh, to, to win games here and to improve. Um, I, I felt we, uh, we fell short on that. Um, I do think uh, we have some pieces in place here. That's why we've actively been re-signing some pieces. That The cupboard isn't bare. This isn't an overhaul. Uh, usually you avoid those type of situations in our league compared to the NFL a bit. Uh, but I do feel we have some talent, and, and we, 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 gotta, we, we just got to play better, put W's on the board, especially at home. With the CFL being such a fan centric league and just the relationship feels like even more tightly knit, right. Than even some of the NFL franchises delivering those home wins, especially and everything else. Does you feel that extra pressure? Uh, you know, I always say pressure is a privilege, right? It's a, it's a privilege to have this opportunity to lead this organization. And I don't take it lightly with my background, uh, being on the business side of sports first, uh, I definitely know what this league means to to fans throughout this nation. Um, and I don't take that lightly as a Canadian executive. There isn't a lot of them in our league. And, and I take my responsibility uh, uh, very highly. Uh, so we want to deliver a winning product in Ottawa. We want to make our, our games exciting. You know, ultimately what we're looking to do is, is compete each year in our division for a home playoff game and see where the chips fall and see where you can go from there. And you see that year in and year out with teams in this league that it's a pretty well-balanced league. The difference between winning and losing is not a wide margin in this league. That's a credit to the people that do their jobs throughout this league. And we just got to win more of those close ones to go four and five on the road. And then 0 and 9 at home is just not acceptable to our fans. Uh, you know, with everything this year, like I said, all the momentum, you know, Mazzoli goes down, like you said, having a number one guy, uh, you know, I mean, personally, do you just feel like the wind's out of your sail at that point? I mean, how do you kind of re regroup and, and take, take, I guess, the personal side out of it? No, no, I, I, you always got to compete. Injuries are a part of this profession and, and part of our job as, 
GMs and coaches in this league is to surround uh, uh, the club with the ability to uh, to handle those injuries and handle that adversity. Um, some position groups are a little tougher than others, obviously, uh, but that can't be used as an excuse. We're paid to win games, and uh, um, you know we had full confidence uh, in, in our quarterbacks, Caleb and Nick. Uh, we obviously reacted quickly uh, in bringing Nick in right after Jeremiah's injury when we knew it was a, a long-term thing. And, and the reason wasn't a lack of confidence in Caleb. It was, well, what happens if this happens to Caleb and, and, and whatnot? You always, a GM's job is to provide answers to the team to give them the best ability to, to feel the team each week. So we felt we needed to react quickly. Um, obviously, Nick had a bit of a head start with – with knowing some of our ter terminology from being in our playbook, the COVID year, but at the same time, he hadn't been through a training camp. It took a little bit of time and Caleb's still progressing as a quarterback. The reality is <clears throat> in two straight years, he's been thrown in tough situations because of injuries where you like a guy to take some time to develop behind a guy, see how it all develops and not be thrust into things. So you saw some moments of, uh, Great play, and you saw some moments of, of not so great play, and that's usually what you're going to get with young quarterbacks. And Nick brought an element of stability, um, uh, of uh, professionalism, uh, of leading a room. And, uh, you know, the reality is we just didn't win enough games. Wasn't entirely on, on any side of the ball. I think all three sides of our ball, from offense to defense to special teams, could take some uh, parts of uh, games during the year where they like to have them back and uh, do something a little differently that could have meant the difference between winning and losing. Yeah, it's just so hard. And I mean, I've had this conversation with lots of people with, you know, all the talent now and trying to get guys into the CFL and it taking multiple years for them to kind of get up to speed, just be in a different game. Uh, it has to be difficult, right? Kind of as a, as a GM and as someone trying to kind of build a roster, right? Well, I think the first difficulty is, guys that come in understanding that it is a new league and, and, you know, be it high school football or college football or NFL, your journey usually doesn't start as a starter. The Dalton Shones are few and far between and you have to buy your time of learning a game either as a backup or on the practice roster. You know, in, in high school, you play JV in college, you got redshirted in the NFL as P squad. And, uh, I think sometimes it takes a bit of a time adjustment to get the respect for the type of competitors there are in our league and understand how our league works uh, roster wise as well. So, uh, you know, that's part of an evolution of a player coming into our league. But definitely, I think there's some things that have been put in place in this new CBA that can help with some consistency in the rosters, which I think players will enjoy, fans will enjoy. And uh, as a GM building a team, I'll enjoy it too. Uh, expand on that. What are some of the things? And I, I mean, we talked a lot about that preseason and leading into everything, but what, what were you happy to see the players get here for? Was it a seven year, seven year CBA here? Well, I definitely think it was a win, 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 be a league team and players for, for having some partial guarantees in the contracts, obviously from a player standpoint, it gives them some certainty. Uh, you know, our league is often harped on, on, bonus roster bonuses and cuts happening behind uh, before them. And the same thing happens in the NFL. It's just, you know, we're talked about in our league because that's who covers our league about it happening. It happens in football. Uh, so to see those partial guarantees, which, you know, makes your decision-making as a GM more important to who the, gives those out. Cause there's some uh, severe uh, restrictions. If you're suddenly paying out two or three partial guarantees with the size of our salary cap. So, helps a player maybe commit to an organization longer term for the GM and head coach. It helps build a roster continuity that you're not constantly starting with from scratch or trying to build a new team and bring new players together and create that environment in that room. And then from a, a fan standpoint, the most important one is just the ability to relate to the players in your community, uh, you know, to, to have guys here maybe for more and more bunches of years so when they're buying jerseys, they're not constantly turning over the jerseys and they can relate to those guys. I just thought it was an excellent decision made by both sides to, to reach a compromise that worked for everyone. I loved that uh, the behind the R series that you're, you know, the staff there did leading into the season. And as I am not a football head, I talk to a lot of really smart people, right. That inform our audience, but as someone that is very much a casual, being able to kind of get behind the wall there, did you enjoy that being able to kind of educate the audience and let them in and some of these really high pressure situations and signing people and trying to negotiate all that out? 
Yeah, I think sometimes you just forget it's there, which it's that's what it's supposed to be is natural, right? We have a lot of trust in Josh on our uh, our uh, behind the R series, uh, you know, work with him daily and just a ton of trust with him uh, and everything. So uh, it, it was sometimes you just forgot it was there and, you know, ultimately some good stuff comes out of it. I, I, I think every fan enjoys maybe a blow up of an F bomb or, or this or that, you know, we're all human, right? We have emotions. My, one of my most competitive days of the season is always those first couple of days of free agency or the draft night. That's where I can really make a mark on this team. The reality is I don't coach the team. <clears throat> I don't, uh, during the season, I don't make those decisions. That's the head coach's job. So those are where I can really impact. So, uh, you know, I feel one of, one of the strengths is of mine is uh, bringing players together, recruiting them and seeing them a vision of what we believe in viewership got a little bit of that behind the scenes. We tried to as much as possible not to do any editing because uh, it, it was deserved to be seen what it is. And uh, I know we'll have four or five episodes coming of sort of a behind the R from the 2022 season that, you, you know, we'll have some good raw content, you know, not necessarily the best content we want to show, but we have to be real. If we're going to be honest with our fan base and show them what, what we're about, we can't just show the good times. We have to show the struggles and the pitfalls. And I think the biggest thing is it'll show the, the work effort and the, what goes into being a head or a, a coach or a player or a management type in football. It's uh, it's not all the game day and jet uh, window jets and, and all that. There's a lot of hours, a lot of sacrifice and more importantly, a lot of care that goes into it that we don't take our jobs lightly. We put a lot of thought and process into things and uh, that, that game day result, if it's a win, it's the greatest thing in the world. And if it's a loss, it's, it, it's just crippling for the next 24 hours that you don't, you just want to get to the next game to get over it. Yeah, I think it it just humanizes a lot of you guys. Right? I think fans just get so callous sometimes. Like, well, I don't, you know, whatever. And I think it really lets them into kind of your head and your space and what it actually feels like to be there. Yeah. Uh, final thoughts before I let you go. I appreciate your time. We just had Bob Dice on talking rebuilding, getting ready for the season. Uh, things you're specifically looking to 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 build on. Feel like you have a good core here headed into the off season and free agency. Yeah, you know, I, I think. Uh, we want to continue to be a fast, physical football team. Uh, we want to have players that compete at the highest level possible that uh, want to sacrifice individual accolades for the betterment of the team. Ultimately, everyone has an ego in this game from me to that coach to players. Uh, we all want uh, we, we want some personal stuff out of it. But the best way to get personal recognition and personal growth is through putting a winning product together. Uh, and uh we want to put a consistent product on a field that's a great entertaining product for our, our Ottawa fans uh, throughout the world. I uh, really appreciate your time. Very thoughtful answers. It means a lot. Thank you so much for giving me some time today. Thanks, Reed. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Well, I know that Jenna and a lot of our American fans, especially the Ottawa Red Blacks fans, will be excited. Here we have Bob Dice coming on. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm great. How are you? We're good. Appreciate this uh, league winter meetings here. Congrats on you know officially being named the you know third head coach of the Red Blacks. How did it feel kind of having it all become official here? Oh, obviously uh, uh, it felt great. You know, uh, Sean Burke went through a really intensive uh, process uh, once the season had ended, and uh, you know, obviously went through the interview process. And uh, when I went into Ottawa for my final interview, it was. Uh, um, felt very good to uh to get named the third coach here in ottawa uh lots of work here to do you know coming off of it was a weird season i felt like there was a lot of momentum going in and a lot of you know mazzoli and everything and it just never felt like it got fully going what was your take of the season well you know i, I think you're right you know obviously there was a few uh, trials and tribulations, you know, uh, peaks and valleys, you know, obviously when you lose a player of Jeremiah's quality, um, that's going to impact you. CFL is such a quarterback driven league, but uh, when you lose a player of Jeremiah's uh, ability, it's going to um, hinder your success somewhat. Um, but I, I will say this, you know, and why I'm so excited for the job is uh, these players fought continually throughout the whole year uh, through some adverse situations. And, um, you know, 
Sean Burke, like I said, has done a really good job. Like you said, the expectations were high at the beginning of the year because Sean had done such a great job in bringing in talent. And, um, and so that's why I'm excited is a great talent base here. And um, as you saw last four games, the guys fought through right to the end. And, uh, you know, we kind of we talked about that being our foundation springing forward for this year. And so we're excited to get going in 2023. You find there's a lot of pieces there you guys are able to work with. Yes, I do. You know, when you, when you look at, uh, again, Jeremiah, everything's uh, checking out and he's coming back uh, strong uh, with this off season. And you look at the guys in our receiving core, like Jalen Acklin and uh, Justin Hardy, uh, Nate Bahar, um, you know, really solid base in there. Devontae Williams did some great things in the, in the backfield and Jacob Ruby really came in and anchored our offensive line and uh, taught those guys, uh, what it was all about. And uh, they did a great job this year is playing well as a unit. So offensively really feel good about what we have there. And some young guys like Cyril um, played well uh, as well. Defensively, uh, same type of thing, you know, you, you know, obviously uh, Lorenzo has an opportunity to be a free agent, going to try and lock him up before that happens. But uh, um, you have players like himself and Avery Williams and guys like Money Hunter and Patrick Levels in our secondary. There's a lot of talented players here, and now it's just our job uh, <clears throat> to, as coaches uh, to get them playing as a cohesive unit and uh, playing hard for 60 minutes. Uh, so, Mazzoli coming back, feeling better. Uh, you, is that where the plan is in place here heading into 2023? Well, yeah, uh, Jeremiah would come back. Yeah, he's uh, he's our guy at quarterback, and, um, you know, he's he, – He's such a great leader. Um, you know, we talk about the on-field play taking the hit when he wasn't there. Um, you know, really what happened as well, because he had a, a, a few um, side effects with the injury and he wasn't around the facility. Jeremiah is such a strong leader that his even his presence uh, not being around really impacted the guys. And, you know, with him being there and uh, we'll see. Uh, where we go with the number two, you know, Nick's uh, has an opportunity to, for free agency. And uh, so it could be him or some other guys coming in and uh, really excited uh, with Jeremiah leading that room in the offense and the team for that matter uh, for what 2023 has in store. How do you view Jeremiah's talent? I mean, it, it was such a big signing when they brought in, and I know this was, you know, before obviously you took over the head coaching, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, big free agent signing, you know, big offseason moves. Uh, how do you view his talent above the rest of the CFL quarterbacks right now? Oh, I see. I see Jeremiah is an upper, upper echelon uh, CFL quarterback. You know, the experience that he's had, um, you just can't uh, take that for granted. Um, again, it's his leadership skills, you know, as well, you want your quarterback to be, he's almost like a coach, a secondary coach for you. And that's what Jeremiah brings. You, you see it, his personality, the players just attracted to him. And then his ability on the field. I mean, he's still extremely mobile, which is a huge benefit in our game. Uh, still a, a great armor. You look at those two games or three games early in the season, he was playing high level football. And uh, we're looking for him uh, to lead us um, and get Ottawa back to where we're, where we should be. And do you think there was enough, you know, even though it wasn't the season you guys wanted enough positive traits here near the end that you guys have enough to build off of? 100%. Um, I said when I was hired that uh, this isn't, uh, I didn't take this job thinking it's a reclamation project uh, and we got a, a long ways to go. I think um, there is a lot of talent here. Obviously, like I said, Sean's done a great job of uh, re-signing some of uh, the guys before they get to free agency. Um, and I'm sure there's more to come. And then once we get into free agency, there'll be obviously there's going to be additions and changes every single year. Um, but um, I, I fully expect us to compete. And I expect us to compete this year right from uh, week one uh, through to 18. And I uh, expect us to be a team to be reckoned with this season. Do you feel like there's a lot of expectations, you know, the home losing streak, the kind of, and all of that, like uh, enough, you know, a passionate fan base, regardless, right. Even through everything, uh, you know, how do you, how do you kind of balance that in your mind of, Hey, we got to make sure that people are happy. Well, I, I think the biggest thing you do is make sure you're doing things right. You know what I mean? Make sure your processes are correct and you're doing things uh, that are going to enable you to have success. You know, I, obviously I think for, People in the city of Ottawa, obviously, they want, yeah, want to see us win that home game in front of our fans. And obviously, we do, too. But um, that's not our sole focus. Our focus is to win, um, play winning 
strong football. And uh, we do that. We know we're going to win home games. Uh, so it's not something that's sitting in our head like, oh, we got to win a home game. We're worried about doing the right thing so that when it comes um, – doing the right things every week so that when it comes to the end of the season, we're, we're playing uh, the very important games then. How challenging is it, you know, obviously you've had coaching experience, you know, tremendous in the past, but to, to step in mid-season like you had to do and kind of say, here, you know, I, I got to fill whatever void that is. How challenging is that just as a leadership of, of men position? Well, you know, I, I guess the one benefit I, I, I felt I had was um, I've been in Ottawa with this group for a while. And they knew what I was about. And I, and I had a pretty good idea what they were about. And um, I believe from the time I was here, uh, we played pretty solid football on special teams. And the guys, the one thing with being a special teams coordinator, you uh, <clears throat> interact with everybody as it is. So you know everybody. And they, they know what my expectations were. And they know how I coach. And I coach hard. Um, and, and so it wasn't as hard maybe um, – in, in that regards, because I felt they had a good relationship with the guys. Um, but at the same time, it, it is because it's, it's someone else's, it's been someone else's boat and you're trying to re re-steer it. Right. And you, four games isn't a long time to change the way people are, uh, have thinking. And especially when you, it's been a challenging situation, but the guys responded exceptionally well, uh, couldn't ask for more from them. They, 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 like I said, they fought hard and we're really excited from that little foundation, uh, to, to grow from that and have some great success this season. I will uh, say that from the people I talked to and everything kind of came about, and obviously you don't want to see anybody lose their job, but you coming in and then obviously being named the head coach, uh, overwhelming positive, which I think in the CFL is kind of a hard thing to get kind of unanimous support all the time. I mean, does that speak to just your track record and the history you have as a coach or the way that you interact with people? I mean, what do you attribute that to? Um, And that's, that, that's a good question. I think, you know, what I've always tried to do is I've tried to do things the right way. And I've always tried to pe treat people, uh, you know, whether it be players, other coaches, um, everybody with respect in what you do. And I think uh, if, if you treat people well, uh, they're happy when good things happen for you. Uh, and so I, I see it no different. I'm obviously very humbled by it um, uh, in, in that regard. But uh, as I say, uh, I was telling my wife the other day, I got to enjoy this while everybody's happy because it's kind of like being the backup quarterback. Uh, all of a sudden, though, when you become the starter, everybody, <laughs> everything changes. And so uh, enjoy enjoying this little honeymoon now. But uh, we're excited to get to work and uh, change things around here quickly. Uh, is he Kahari Jones come in? You know, obviously another fan favorite that way. Thoughts about incorporating him in and how all that's going to work? Yeah, uh, you know, Kahari and I have a long background uh, together and, you know, I coached him as a player and he brings all the intangibles that I'm looking for when I'm looking for leaders of men. Uh, he's, he's done a great job uh, as a former player. He, he sees things very well and he communicates them well. And, and um, you know, he's as a quarterback, you are a leader. And so um, our relationship has changed, you know. Then when we worked together in Saskatchewan, we worked together. He was my quarterback coach when I was the offensive coordinator. And again, I got to see him work in a positive light as a coach. And then just to see his work from the outside uh, that he did in Montreal as a coordinator and head coach. But I knew, I knew uh, very early that uh, he was going to be one of those guys that I talked to and uh, that I, I would want to, want to work with because just of all those positive attributes he has. Well, I think it's a, you know, it's another fan favorite that maybe, you know, a lot of people maybe didn't think he got a fair shake or kind of got, you know, uh, unfortunately kind of maligned and whatever. And being able to come in, got to kind of get a fresh start with you again here in Ottawa. It has to be exciting, I think, for the fan base there, just if you, if you want to see a you know compelling offense on the field. 100%. You look at the car, car he's very innovative in what he does. And um, we're excited. I know Jeremiah is excited. Uh, and I think the offense as a whole, you know, when, you know, I'm very excited about the whole, well, obviously the whole staff, um, those guys, you know, they've started, started, obviously started their meetings and, um, you know, like I said, as Kari leading that group's very exciting. And um, you can see how quickly really wanted to get him named because he was going to be a bigger part of what the success we have here. What do you get, want the, uh, you know, the Red Box to be known as kind of here next year? What do you want your brand of football to be? Well, I want, us, want it to be winning football first off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, really very similar to how we've played special teams here over the last uh, a few years. You know, we're, we're very – we hold ourselves to a very high standard and play or, and to play at a high level. And 
we hold each other accountable and we're going to be a very fast physical team that plays with a great energy and a great competitive nature. Um, but most importantly, um, you're going to see a team that uh, maybe does a little bit job, a better job finishing over, over throughout the, the course of games. And uh, even Keeled, uh, obviously it's a very emotion game, but we got to, we got to make sure we keep our emotions in check. And, uh, but uh, very fast, very physical and uh, also a smart team. I just announced Devontae Denman coming back, you know, one of the return specialists, big signing that way. Uh, are you expecting to have a lot of exciting moves like that here headed into the, you know, 2023? 100%. Obviously, very, very excited to have Devontae back. Obviously, he and I have a very tight relationship in, uh, uh, from my time as special teams coordinator. Again, a dynamic personality, uh, not only in uh, Ottawa, but uh, for the league. Um, and so excited. The guys, he's the type of player that the players just love to play for or block for. And yeah, so uh, like as I was saying earlier, there's going to be uh, some some changes and some additions. And so we're, we're excited for that. And, you know, obviously... Um, as well, expect to see some uh, some of our current players brought back as well. So it's going to be a great mix of uh, uh, new and and uh, and players who've been here in the past. So we're just very excited to Sean's done a great job of uh, putting it all together, and I'm looking forward to see what happens here in free agency as well. With you stepping into the you know the permanent head coaching you know now uh, obviously bringing in Kahari a lot of the other off season coaching changes thus far how, how do you feel the current level of coaching staff is in the CFL across the board? Uh, you mean our staff as compared just, or uh, just CFL in general the quality of uh, staffing right now? Oh, I, I I think it's you know probably as good or better than it's ever been. I think you know. Uh, what what we find is, is now, I mean, when you look at uh, guys like myself, who are Canadian guys, we, we we've been able to get more uh, more exposed um, in in recent years and get access down into the states and everything like that. And then you know you look at there's some fantastic coaches who always who've always been coming up here from the U.S. Uh, in the past, and and I think now uh, you look at the across the board, just just uh, you know running into guys here uh, even this this week uh just a great group of experienced guys and 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 as well there's some some young fresh blood that's bringing in new ideas and uh and so i think coaching across the cfl is uh is like i said as good as it has been uh in in a long time well good well i wish you luck here i know you know, i said you're kind of bringing up the reins here end of the season now running them fresh i think it'll be exciting uh things fans should look forward to before i let you go Pardon? I Sorry? said just anything fans to look forward to before I let you go. Any final comments? Oh, I, I would just say this. I, I think, uh, you know, one thing you'll see about these players, these players are excited to uh, play for the fans of Ottawa and um, win for the fans of Ottawa. And uh, they're excited to get back on the field uh, coming out here in May. So um, just get, like I said, get ready for a very exciting, aggressive phys physical team in, from Ottawa that uh, is going to compete to the end. And like I said, play some winning football. Well, I really appreciate your time. Best of luck here heading forward. All right. Very nice meeting you, and thank you for your time. Thanks. Huge special thanks to all of our guests this week. Uh, everyone, lots of work from people in, in all sorts of different leagues helping to coordinate and facilitate that this week. Uh, really appreciate uh, the XFL offices. Matt over with the Renegades for helping set up the Jonathan Heimbach interview. Jonathan taking time, you know, end of a work week uh, on a Friday evening in Arlington to sit at the stadium and spend an extra, you know, 25 minutes with me. Really appreciate that. Everyone taking the time to do that. Jonathan and Matt, everyone there. Really appreciate Lucas and everyone over at the CFL offices for coordinating all of that, putting up with me, this crazy American podcast, helping to provide uh, six plus, uh, you know, obviously Randy Ambrosi, all of our CFL media day interviews, everybody with the Argos, uh, the Rough Riders and the Red Blacks. Really appreciate that. And then of course, Anthony Miller taking time after work uh, late at night to help uh, you know kind of come on do his uh, Renegades preview. Really appreciate Anthony and everyone else. I think that's going to do it for me. I'm going to try to get out here and hit the beach here for at least a minute and go walk up and down the boardwalk before I go crack some beers with the professor. Thank you all so much. Check out the Jordan Palmer QBX uh, thing on the XFL YouTube channel. Uh, like and subscribe. I don't have my Brian Scott football with me this week, but uh, make sure you like and subscribe. Be part of our uh, rapidly approaching 2,500. I think we're less than 100 now. Who would have thought? 
approaching the XFL kickoff and everything else. I thank you guys all so much. We'll see you next time.